Surface Detail by Ian M. Banks Read by Peter Kenny Chapter 1 This one might be trouble. She heard one of them say this, only ten or so meters away in the darkness. Even over her fear, the sheer naked terror of being hunted, she felt a shiver of excitement, of something like triumph when she realized they were talking about her. Yes, she thought. She would be trouble. She already was trouble. And they were worried too. The hunters experienced their own fears during the chase. Well, at least one of them did. The man who'd spoken was Yaskin, Vepper's principal bodyguard and chief of security. Yaskin. Of course. Who else? You think so, do you? said a second man. That was Vepers himself. It felt as though something curdled inside her when she heard his deep, perfectly modulated voice, right now attenuated to something just above a whisper. But then they're all trouble. He sounded out of breath. Can't you see anything with those? He must be talking about Yaskin's enhancing oculenses, a fabulously expensive piece of hardware like heavy-duty sunglasses. They turned night to day, made heat visible, and could see radio waves, allegedly. Yaskin tended to wear them all the time, which he had always thought was just showing off or betrayed some deep insecurity. Wonderful though they might be, they had yet to deliver her into Vepper's exquisitely manicured hands. She was standing, flattened against a flat scenery. In the gloom, a moment before she had spread herself against the enormous backdrop, she'd been able to make out that it was just painted canvas with great sweeps of dark and light paint, but she'd been too close to it to see what it actually portrayed. She angled her head out a little, and risked a quick look down and to the left, to where the two men were standing on a gantry, cantilevered out from the side of the fly tower's north wall. She glimpsed a pair of shadowy figures, one holding something that might have been a rifle. She couldn't be sure. Unlike Yaskin, she had only her own eyes to see with. She brought her head back in again, quickly but smoothly, scared that she might be seen, and tried to breathe deeply, evenly, silently. She twisted her neck this way and that, clenched and unclenched her fists, flexed her already aching legs. She was standing on a narrow wooden ledge at the bottom of the flat. It was slightly narrower than her shoes. She had to keep her feet splayed, toes pointing outwards in opposite directions, to stop herself from falling. Beneath, Unseen in the darkness, the wide rear stage of the opera house was twenty meters further down. If she fell, there were probably other cross gantries or scenery towers in the way for her to hit on the way down. Above her, unseen in the gloom, was the rest of the fly tower and a gigantic carousel that sat over the rear of the opera house's stage and stored all the multifarious sets its elaborate productions required. She started to edge very slowly along the ledge away from where the two men stood on the wall gantry. Her left heel still hurt, where she'd dug out a tracer device days earlier. Sulbazgi, she heard Vepers say, voice low. He and Yaskin had been talking quietly to each other. Now they were probably using a radio or something similar. She didn't hear any answer from Dr. Sulbazgi. Probably Yaskin was wearing an earpiece. Maybe Vepers too, though he rarely carried a phone or any other comms gear. Vepers, Yaskin, and Dr. S. She wondered how many were chasing her as well as these three. Vepers had guards to command, a whole retinue of servants, aides, helpers, and other employees who might be pressed into service to help in a pursuit like this. The Opera House's own security would help too, if called on. The place belonged to Vepers, after all, and no doubt Vepers' good friend, the city chief of police, would lend any forces requested of him. In the highly unlikely event, Vepers couldn't muster enough of his own. She kept on sliding her way along the ledge. On the north side wall, she heard Vepers say after a few moments, gazing up at varied bucolic backdrops and scenic scenes. No sign of our little illustrated girl. He sighed, theatrically, she thought, which was at least appropriate. Ledeja? He called out suddenly. She was startled to hear her own name. She trembled and felt the painted flat at her back wobble. Her left hand flew to one of the two knives she'd stolen. The double sheath looped onto the belt of the workman's trousers she was wearing. She started to tip forward, felt herself about to fall. 
She brought her hand back, steadied herself again. Lededra. His voice, her name, echoed inside the great dark depths of the fly carousel. She shuffled further along the narrow ledge. Was it starting to bend? She thought she felt it flexing beneath her feet. Lededra. Vepers called again. Come on now, this is becoming boring. I have a terribly important reception to attend in a couple of hours, and you know how long it takes to get me properly dressed and ready. You'll have Astiel threatening. You wouldn't want that now, would you? She indulged a sneer. She didn't give a damn what Astiel Vepers' pompous butler thought or felt. You've had your few days of freedom, but that's over now. Accept it. Vepper's deep voice said, echoing, "Come out like a good girl, and I promise you won't be hurt. Not much, anyway. A slap, perhaps, a minor addition to your body mark, just possibly. Small, a detail, obviously, and exquisitely done, of course. I'd have it no other way." She thought she could hear him smiling as he spoke, but no more. I swear. Seriously, dear child, come out now. While I can still persuade myself this is merely charming high spirits and attractive rebelliousness, rather than gross treachery and outright insult. Fuck you, Lidaja said, very, very quietly. She took another couple of shuffling, sliding steps along the thin wooden band at the foot of the flat. She heard what might have been a creak beneath her. She swallowed and kept on going. Lededra, come on! Vepper's voice boomed out. I'm trying terribly hard to be reasonable here. I am being reasonable, aren't I, Yaskin? She heard Yaskin mutter something. Then Vepper's voice pealed out again. Yes, indeed, there you are. Even Yaskin thinks I'm being reasonable, and he's been making so many excuses for you. He's practically on your side. What more can you ask for? So. Now it's your turn. This is your last chance. Show yourself, young lady. I'm becoming impatient. This is no longer funny. Do you hear me? Oh, very clearly, she thought. How he liked the sound of his own voice. Joy Levepers had never been one to fight shy of letting the world know exactly what he thought about anything, and thanks to his wealth. Influence and extensive media interests, the world, indeed, the system, the entire enablement, had never really had much choice but to listen. I'm serious, Lededja. This is not a game. This stops now, by your choice, if you've any sense, or I make it stop. And trust me, scribble child, you do not want me to make it stop. Another sliding step. Another creak from beneath her feet. Well, at least his voice might cover any noise she might be making. Five beats, Lededja, he called. Then we do it the hard way. Her feet slid slowly along the thin strip of wood. All right, Vepers said. She could hear the anger in his voice, and despite her hate, her utter contempt for him. Something about that tone still had the effect of sending a chill of fear through her. Suddenly, there was a noise like a slap, and for an instant she thought he'd struck Yaskin across the face. Then realized it was just a hand clap. One, he shouted. A pause, then another clap. Two. Her right hand, tightly gloved, was extended as far as she could reach, feeling for the thin strip of wood that formed the edge of the scenery flat. Beyond that should lie the wall and ladders, steps, gantries, even just ropes, anything to let her make her escape. Another, even louder clap, echoing in the dark, lost spaces of the carousel fly tower. Three. She tried to remember the size of the opera stage. She'd been here a handful of times with Vepers and the rest of his extended entourage, brought along as a trophy, a walking medal denoting his commercial victories. She ought to be able to remember. All she could recall was being sourly impressed by the scale of everything, the brightness, depth, and working complexity of the scenery, the physical effects produced by trapdoors, hidden wires, smoke machines, and fireworks, 
the sheer amount of noise the hidden orchestra and the strutting overdressed singers and their embedded microphones could create. It had been like watching a very convincing supersize hollow screen, but one comically limited to just this particular width and depth and height of set, and incapable of the sudden cuts and instant changes of scene and scale possible in a screen. There were hidden cameras focused on the principal players and side screens at the edge of the stage showing them in 3D close-up, but it was still, perhaps just because of the obviously prodigious amount of effort, time, and money spent on it all, a bit pathetic, really. It was as though being fabulously rich and powerful meant not being able to enjoy a film, or at least not being able to admit to enjoying one. But still, you had to try to recreate films on stage. She hadn't seen the point. Vepers had loved it. Four. Only afterwards, mingling, paraded, socialising, exhibited, had she realised it was really just an excuse, and the opera itself a sideshow. The true spectacle of the evening was always played out inside the sumptuous foyer, upon the glittering staircases, within the curved sweep of dazzlingly lit, high-ceilinged corridors, beneath the towering chandeliers in the palatial anterooms. Around fabulously laden tables in resplendently decorated saloons, in the absurdly grand restrooms and in the boxes, front rows and elected seats of the auditorium, rather than on the stage itself, the super rich and ultra powerful regarded themselves as the true stars, and their entrances and exits, gossip, approaches, advances, suggestions, proposals, and prompts within the public spaces of this massive building constituted the proper business of the event. Enough of this melodrama, lady! Vepers shouted. If it was just the three of them, Vepers, Yaskin, and Solbazgi, and if it stayed just the three of them, she might have a chance. She had embarrassed Vepers, and he wouldn't want any more people to know about that than absolutely had to. Yaskin and Doctor S didn't count. They could be relied upon. They would never talk. Others might. Others would. If outsiders had to be involved, they would surely know she had disobeyed him and bested him even temporarily. He would feel the shame of that, magnified by his grotesque vanity. It was that overweening self-regard, that inability to suffer even the thought of shame, that might let her get her way. Five. She paused, felt herself swallow as the final clap resounded in the darkness around her. So. That's what you want," Vepers shouted. Again, she could hear the anger in his voice. "You had your chance, Lidedra. Now we, sir," she shouted, not too loudly, still looking away from him in the direction she was shuffling. "What? Was that her?" "Led?" Yaskin shouted. "Sir," she yelled, keeping her voice lower than a full shout, but trying to make it sound as though she was putting all her effort into it. I'm here. I'm done with this. My apologies, sir. I'll accept whatever punishment you choose. Indeed, you will. She heard Vepers mutter. Then he raised his voice. Where is here? He called. Where are you? She raised her head, projecting her voice into the great dark spaces above, where vast sets like stacked cards loomed. In the tower, sir, near the top, I think. She's up there. Yaskin said, sounding incredulous. "Can you see her? No, sir." "Can you show yourself, little Edger?" Pepper shouted. "Let us see where you are. Have you a light?" "Um, uh, wait a moment, sir," she said in her half shout, angling her head upwards again. She shuffled a little faster along the ledge now. She had an image in her head of the size of the stage, the sets and flats that came down to produce backgrounds for the action. They were vast, enormously wide. She probably wasn't halfway across yet. I have, she began, then let her voice fade away. This might buy her a little extra time, might keep Vepers from going crazy. The general manager is with Doctor Solbazki now, sir. She heard Yaskin say. Is he now? Vepers sounded exasperated. The general manager is upset, sir. Apparently, he wishes to know what is going on in his opera house. It's my fucking opera house. Vepers said loudly, "Oh, all right. Tell him we're looking for a stray, and have Solbazki turn on the lights. We might as well now." There was a pause, and he said testily, "Yes, of course, all the lights." 
Shit, the Dedja breathed. She tried to move even faster, felt the wooden ledge beneath her feet bounce. The Dedja, Vethas shouted. Can you hear me? She didn't reply. The Dedja, stay where you are. Don't risk moving. We're going to turn on the lights. The lights came on. There were fewer than she'd expected, and it became dimly lit around her rather than dazzlingly bright. Of course, most of the lights would be directed at the stage itself, not up into the scenery inside the fly tower carousel. Still, there was enough light to gain a better impression of her surroundings. She could see the greys, blues, blacks and whites of the painted flat she was pressed against, though she still had no idea what the enormous painting represented, and could see the dozens of massive hanging backgrounds, some three-dimensional, metres thick, sculpted to resemble port scenes, town squares, peasant villages, mountain crags, forest canopies, hanging above her. They bowed out as they ascended, held inside the barrel depths of the carousel like vast pages in some colossal illustrated book. She was about halfway along the flat, almost directly above the middle of the stage, fifteen metres or more still to go. It was too far. She would never make it. She could see down, too. The brightly shining stage was easily twenty metres below. She tore her gaze away. The creaking sound beneath her desperately shuffling feet had taken on a rhythm now. What could she do? What other way out was there? She thought of the knives. I still can't, Leffer said. Sir, that bit of scenery, it's moving, look. Shit, 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 she breathed, trying to move still faster. Ledeja, are you— She heard steps then. Sir, she's there, I can see her. Buggering fuck, she had time to say. Then heard the creaking noise beneath her turn into a splitting, splintering sound, and felt herself sinking, being lowered gently at first. She brought her hands in, unsheathed both knives. Then there was a noise like a gunshot. The wooden ledge beneath her gave way and she started to fall. She heard Yaskin shout something. She twisted, turned, stabbed both knives into the plasticized canvas of the flat, holding on grimly to each handle as she pulled herself in as close as she could, her gloved fists at her shoulders, hearing the canvas tear and watching it split in front of her eyes, the twin blades slicing quickly down to the foot of the enormous painting where the jagged remains of the wooden ledge sagged and fell. The knives were going to cut right through the bottom of the canvas. She was sure she'd seen something like this done in a film, and it had all looked a lot easier. Hissing, she twisted both knives, turning each blade from vertical to horizontal. She stopped falling and hung there, bouncing gently on the torn, straining canvas. Her legs swung in space beneath her. Shit, this wasn't going to work. Her arms were getting sore and starting to shake already. What she? she heard Beppa say then. Oh, my God! She's... Have them rotate the carousel, sir, Yaskin said quickly. Once it's in the right position, they can lower her to the stage. Of course. Sobaski? She could hardly hear what they were saying. She was breathing so hard, and her blood was pounding in her ears. She glanced to one side. The now broken length of wood she'd been sliding along had been attached to the bottom of the scenery flat by big staples sunk into the double-folded hem of the giant painting. To her right, just under a body length away from her, some of these still held. She started swinging herself from side to side, her breath whooshing and hissing out of her as she forced her arms to stay locked in position while her legs and lower body pendulumed. She thought she heard the two men shouting at her, but she couldn't be sure. She swung wildly to and fro, moving the whole rippling extent of the scenery flat. Nearly there. She hooked her right leg onto the ledge, found perches, and detached one knife, hooking and stabbing at the canvas above her keeping the blade horizontal, flat, angled down behind the canvas. The knife held. She hauled herself up until she was about midway between prone and upright. She brought the other knife out and swung it up too, still higher. Now what she... Ledeja! Yaskin yelled. Stop! You'll kill yourself! She was upright, hanging by the two embedded knives. She swung up and out, stuck a blade in still further up. Her arm muscles felt as though they were on fire but she was pulling herself upwards. She'd had no idea that she possessed such strength. Her pursuers controlled the machinery, of course. They could rotate the whole vast apparatus and could lower her as they wished, but she'd resist them to the last. Vepers had no idea. He was the one who still thought this was a game. She knew it was to the death. Then there was a deep humming sound, and with a low moaning noise, 
the whole scenery flat and all the others around, above and below it, started to move. Upwards, hauling the scenery flat up into the dim heights of the enormous carousel. Upwards! She wanted to laugh, but had no breath for it. She was feeling for the knife holes beneath with her feet now, finding them, using them as footholds, taking some of the strain off her protesting arm muscles. That's the wrong fucking way! Vepa screamed. She heard Yaskin shouting something too. That's the wrong fucking way! Vepa bellowed again. Make it stop! Other way! Other way! Zulbazgi, what are you playing at? Zulbazgi! The gigantic carousel continued to turn, rotating the sets and flats like a vast spit roast. She glanced over her shoulder and saw that, as the whole assemblage rotated, lifting the back door that she was climbing away from above the stage itself, it was getting closer to the next flat. All of the stacked sets pressing in towards each other as they came to the horizontal limit of the space. The set, closing in on her back, looked plain and smooth and lacking in features. Just another painted scene with a few thin supporting crossbeams and as hard to climb as this one. Above, she could see more complicated, three-dimensional sets, some boasting lights that must have come on when they'd turned on all the rest. She put her face against the canvas, stared through the knife hole she'd just made. A very convincing oldie-worldie rooftop scene greeted her. Oddly angled gutters, quaintly tiny dormer windows, steep-pitched slate roofs, wonky chimney pots, some with real pretend smoke just starting to come out of them. And a net, a tracery of tiny blue lights strung right across the width of the set and for twenty metres or more above the chimneys and ridge tiles, impersonating stars. The whole thing was sliding gradually closer, edging slowly downwards as the carousel continued to revolve. She ignored the still shouting men, slit a hole in the canvas big enough for her to slip through, and, once on the far side, launched herself at the rooftop set. The canvas flat she'd thrown herself from moved away as she kicked back at it. She started to fall, heard herself scream, then half her body from the waist up thudded into the fake slates. Winded, she found both her knives had gone, and she was holding on with both hands to a set of flimsy-feeling railings in front of a tall set of windows. Something clattered. Far beneath her. The knives, she guessed. The two men below were still shouting. It sounded like half at her and half at Dr. Sulbazki. She wasn't listening to either of them. Vepers and Yaskin couldn't see her now. Part of the rooftop set was hiding her from them. She hauled herself up on the phony wrought iron railings, the plastic bending in her grip and threatening to break. She found more handholds on hoax gutters, dummy window ledges and counterfeit chimneys. She was at the top, trying to make her way along the ridge through the cold, fake smoke issuing from the chimney pots, when the carousel came grinding to a stop, making the whole set judder. She lost her footing, slipped and fell down the far side, screaming. The tracery of tiny lights, the pretend starfield of a clear night sky, caught her, entangling her in their chilly blue embrace. The net bowing and stretching, but not breaking. The hard wires conjoining the lights seemed to wrap themselves around her and tighten as she struggled. Now, she heard Vepers shout. There was a single crack of rifle fire. An instant later, she felt a blindingly sharp pain on her right hip, and then, moments after that, the little fake blue stars and the drifting smoke that wasn't real smoke, and the whole insane edifice, all just drifted away from her. Manhandled she was being manhandled. Now she was being laid down on a hard surface. Her limbs flopped around her, feeling somehow disconnected. If she'd had to guess, she'd have hazarded that she'd been gently placed here, rather than just thrown down. That was a good sign. She hoped it was, anyway. Her head felt okay, not nearly as sore as the last occasion. She wondered how much time had passed. They had probably taken her back to the townhouse, just a few city segments away from the opera house. She might even be back in Aspersium. Runaways were usually returned to the great estate to await Vepper's pleasure. Sometimes you had to wait days or even weeks to discover the full extent of your punishment. One of Yaskin's tranquilizer rounds usually knocked you out for a good few hours. There would have been time to get her anywhere on the planet, or off it. It struck her, as she lay there hearing muffled words spoken around her, that she was thinking a lot more clearly than she'd have expected. She found she could control her eyes and open them as narrowly as she could, peering through the lashes to see whatever was around her. Townhouse? The estate? Interesting to find out. 
The surroundings were dim. Veppers was standing over her, all perfect teeth, radiantly elegant face, white mane, golden skin, wide shoulders, and dramatic cloak. There was somebody else there, more felt than seen, doing something at her hip. Doctor Sulbazgi, grizzled, brown, square of face and frame, walked into view, handing Veppers something. Your knives, sir," he said. Veppers took them, inspected them. He shook his head. "Little bitch," he breathed. "Taking these, they were your grandfather's," Zulbazki said, voice rumbling. "Yes, we know." "Little bitch," Veppers said, and almost chuckled. "Mind you, they were her great grandfather's before that, so you can see." But still, he slid both knives into his waistband. Doctor Zolbazki was squatting down now to her left, looking at her. He put a hand to her face, wiping away some of the pale millimeter-thick makeup she'd applied. He wiped the hand on his jacket, leaving a pale streak. It was very dim around her, dim above Doctor S too, and their voices hardly echoed at all, as though they were standing in some enormous space. Something didn't feel right. There was a tug at her hip, no pain at all. Yaskin's pale, lean face came into view, made insectile by the oculenses. He was squatting by her right side, still holding the rifle, the trank dart in his other hand. It was hard to tell in the dim light with the lenses obscuring half the man's face, but it looked like he was frowning at the dart. Behind him, a scaffolding tower reached up to an enormous roofscape, hanging in the dimness. Its roofs oddly angled and foreshortened. Its comically askew chimneys still leaking pretend smoke. Great God! She was still in the opera house, and quickly coming too, almost undrugged by some miracle. I think her eye just flickered, Veppers said, and started to lower himself towards her, cloak belling out around him. She closed her eyes quickly, shutting out the view. She felt a tremor run through her body. She half flexed her hand and fingers, and sensed that she would be able to move now if she wanted to. Can't have, the doctor said. She ought to be out for hours, shouldn't she, Yaskin? Wait, Yaskin said. This round hit the bone. Might not have fully. What absurd beauty, Veppers said quietly, his deep, infinitely seductive voice very, very near to her. She felt him wipe at her face as well, removing the makeup she had applied to hide her markings. Isn't it odd? I rarely just look at her this close, as a rule. That is because, she thought calmly, when you rape me, sir, you choose to take me from behind. She sensed his breath, a wave of warmth on her cheek. Sulbazki took her wrist in his chubby hand, gently probing for a pulse. Sir, she might not. Yaskin began. Her eyes flicked open. She was staring into Veppa's face, immediately over hers, filling her field of vision. His eyes started to widen. And an expression of alarm began to form on his fabulously smooth and perfect features. She pushed herself up and twisted her head, opening her mouth, baring her teeth, and aiming for his throat. She must have closed her eyes at the last instant, but sensed him pulling up and away. Her teeth crunched closed on something, and Veppers shrieked. Her head was shaken back and forth as her teeth remained tight around whatever she had bitten, and he tried desperately to pull himself free. Get her off me! He screeched, his voice strangled and nasal. She bit harder with the last of her strength and forced another anguished scream from Veppers as something tore free. Then her jaw was clamped from beneath, an iron grip causing astounding pain, and she had to let go. She could taste blood. Her head was forced back down to the floor with a painful thud, and she opened her eyes to see Veppers staggering away, clutching his nose and mouth, blood coursed down over his chin and shirt. Yaskin was holding her head down, hands still clamped round her jaw and neck. Doctor Zolbazki was rising from her side to go to his master. There was something hard and grisly in her mouth, something almost too big to swallow. She forced it down all the same, gagging and spluttering. Whatever it was, it hesitated as it passed down her throat beneath Yaskin's clamping hands, and he might have thought to stop her swallowing, but didn't. She grabbed a tight, wheezing breath. Hushy, <laughs> Veppers sobbed as Zolbazki came up to him. Teasing the taller man's hands away from his face, Veppers, staring down, cross-eyed, took a sudden breath too. 
She fucking has. She's been my fucking nose off. He howled. Vepers pushed Slobazki away, sending the older man staggering. Then took two steps to where she lay, held down by Yaskin. She saw the knives in Vepers' hands. Sir, Yaskin said, taking one hand away from her throat and raising it towards his master. Vepers kicked Yaskin aside and straddled at Edger before she could even start to rise, pinning her arms to the floor. Blood was flowing freely from his nose and spattering all over her face, neck, and shirt. Oh. Not even the whole nose. She had time to think. Just the tip. A fine ragged mess, though. Try laughing that off at your next diplomatic reception, Prime Executive Vepers. He plunged the first knife into her throat and slashed sideways. The second into her chest. The second knife hit off a rib, bouncing away. Upper arms trapped. She tried as best she could to put her hands up as her breath bubbled out of her neck. The taste of blood was very strong. And she needed to breathe and to cough, but could do neither. Vepers batted her hands away as he looked down and carefully aimed his next thrust a finger width further down from the one that had been deflected. He briefly lowered his face to hers. "You little cunt!" he screamed. Some of his blood fell into her slackly open mouth. "I was supposed to appear in public this evening." He pushed hard, and the blade slid between her ribs and into her heart. She looked up into the darkness as her heart thrashed and jerked around the blade, as though trying to clutch it. Then her heart spasmed one last time and fell back to a sort of faintly trembling, pulseless calm for a moment. When Vepers jerked the knife out, even that ceased. A weight infinitely greater than that of just one man seemed to settle on her. She felt too tired to breathe now. Her last breath. Fluttered from her torn open windpipe like a departing lover. Somehow, everything seemed to have gone very quiet and still around her, even though she was aware of shouting and could feel Vepers rise up and offer, though not without giving her a final slap across the face, just for good measure. She could sense the other two men were moving quickly to her side once again, touching, feeling, trying to staunch, to find a pulse to plug her wounds. Too late now. She thought, meant nothing. The darkness was moving in remorselessly from the edges of her field of vision. She stared up into it, unable even to blink. She waited for some profound insight or thought, but none came. High above her, the simulated sceneries and architectures stacked within the giant carousel swung slowly back and forth, all slowly going dim. In front of the hanging roofscape above her, she could see a flat, tattered-looking mountain scene, all soaring snowy peaks and ruggedly romantic crags beneath a cloud-dotted sky of blue. The effect somewhat spoiled by rips and tears in the fabric and a broken lower frame. So, that was what she'd been pressed up against: mountains, sky, perspective. She thought woozily, slowly, as she died. What a wonderful thing! Chapter Two. Conscript Vatoy, late of their Highness's First Cavalry, now reduced to the Third Expeditionary Sappers, wiped his sweating brow with a grimy, calloused hand. He worked his knees forward a few centimeters across the stony floor of the tunnel, sending fresh darts of pain up his legs. And plunged the short-handled spade into the shadowy face of the pebble-dotted wall of dirt immediately ahead of him. The exertion set off further stabs of pain, which ran up his back and across his straining shoulders. The worn spade bit into the compacted earth and stones, its tip connecting with a larger rock hidden within. The collision jarred his hands, arms, and shoulders, setting his teeth on edge and ringing his aching back as though it was a bell. He almost cried out. But instead, just sucked in a breath of stale, warm, humid air, pungently scented with his own bodily odors and those of the other sweating, straining miners around him. He worked the embedded spade to one side within the dirt, and tried to sense the edge of the buried rock, pulling the spade out and heaving it back in again, a little to the side, in an attempt to find the edge of the obstruction and lever it out. The spade bit into solidity on both sides, making his arms and back ache again each time. 
He let the breath out, putting the spade down by his right thigh and feeling behind him for his pickaxe. He had moved too far forward since he'd last used it and had to look round, back muscles protesting to find it. He turned carefully, anxious not to get in the way of the man to his right, who was already swinging hard with his own pickaxe, cursing under his breath all the time. The new kid on his other side, whose name he'd already forgotten, was still stabbing weakly at the face with his spade, producing little. He was a big, powerful-looking lad, but still face-weak. He'd need to be relieved soon if they were to keep up to target, though he'd pay for such a deemed lack of application. Behind Vatoy, in the flickering, lamplit gloom, the tunnel stretched back into darkness. Half-naked men on their knees or walking bent over at the waist, shuffled about the confined space, loaded with spades and shovels, picks and pry bars. Somewhere behind them, over their coughs and wheezed, bitten-off exchanges, he heard the irregular hollow rumble of an empty rubble wagon approaching. He saw it thud into the buffers at the end of the line. Feeling delicate again, Vatoy, the junior captain said, walking over to him, back bent. The junior captain was the only man at the face still wearing the top half of his uniform. He was sneering, and had tried to put some sarcasm into his voice, though he was so young Vatoy still thought of him as a child, and found it hard to take him seriously. The delicacy the junior captain was referring to had occurred an hour earlier, just after the start of Vatoy's shift, when he'd felt and then been sick, sending an extra unwanted shovelful of waste back to the surface in a rubble wagon. He'd felt ill since just after breakfast, back at the surface and on the walk to the face. The last part especially, doubled over, had been a nightmarish slog of increasing nausea. That was always a bad bit for him anyway. He was tall, and his back hit more of the roof support beams than the other men. He was developing what the long-serving sappers called back buttons, raised welts of hardened skin above each bone in his spine, like giant warts. Ever since he'd thrown up, his stomach had been rumbling, and he'd had a raging thirst that the single meagre hourly water ration had done little to alleviate. There was a chorus of shouting starting further back in the tunnel, and another rumbling sound. For a moment he thought it was the start of a cave-in, and felt a sickening pulse of fear run through him, even as another part of his mind thought, at least it might be quick, and that would be an end to it. Then another rubble wagon came hurtling out of the darkness, and slammed into the rear of the first one, sending dust bursting out from both wagons and knocking the leading wheels of the front wagon off the track, just in front of the buffers. There was more shouting and swearing as the track layers were blamed for unsettling the track behind. The surface wagon emptiers were cursed for not fully emptying the wagon in the first place, and everybody else further up was shouted at for not giving them more warning. The junior captain ordered everybody away from the face to help get the wagon back on the rails, then added, Not you, the toy. Keep working. Sir, he said, lifting the pickaxe. At least with nobody around him he could get a proper swing at the obstruction. He turned back and heaved the pick at a spot to the side of where the spade had balked, briefly imagining that he was swinging it at the back of the young captain's head. He hauled the pick out, twisted it to present the flat blade rather than the spike towards the face, found a slightly different position, and swung hard again. You developed a feel for what was going on at the end of a shovel or a pick. You started to gain an insight into the just-hidden depths in front of you after a while. There was another jarring strike to add to all the others that had run up through his hands into his arms and back over the year he had been down here. But he sensed the slightly flattened blade make a sort of double strike inside the face, sliding between two rocks, or into a cleft in a single more massive rock. That felt hollow, he thought, but dismissed the idea. He had leverage now, a degree of purchase. He strained at the worn smooth handle of the pick. Something grated inside the face, and the weak light from his helmet lamp showed a stretch of dirt face as long as his forearm and tall as his head, hinging out towards him. Dirt and pebbles slumped about his knees. What fell out of the hole was a piece of dressed stonework, and beyond was a rectangular hole and a damp darkness, a dirt-free, inky absence from which a thin, cold wind issued, smelling of old, cold stone. The great castle, the besieged fortress, stood over the broad plain on a carpet of ground-hugging mist like something unreal. Vatoy remembered his dreams, 
In his dreams, the castle truly was not real or not there, or genuinely did float above the plain by magic or some technology unknown to him. And so they burrowed on forever, never finding its base, tunnelling on without cease through the killing muggy warmth and sweat mist of their own exhalations in an eternal agony of purposeless striving. He had never mentioned these dreams to anybody, unsure who amongst his comrades he could really trust, and judging that if word of these nightmares got back to his superiors, they might be deemed treacherous, implying that their labours were pointless, doomed to failure. The castle sat on a spur of rock, an island of stone jutting above the floodplain of the great meandering river. The castle itself was formidable enough. The cliffs that surrounded it made it close to impregnable. Still, it had to be taken, they'd been told. After nearly a year of trying to starve the garrison into surrender, it had been judged, two years or more ago, that the only way to take the stronghold was to get a great siege engine close in to the rocky outcrop. Enormous machines had been constructed of wood and metal and manoeuvred towards the castle on a specially built road. The machines could hurl rocks or fizzing metal bombs, the weight of ten men, many hundreds of strides across the plain. But there was a problem. To get them close enough to the castle meant coming within range of the fortress's own great war machine, a giant trebuchet, mounted on the single massive circular tower dominating the citadel. With its own range increased by virtue of its elevation, the castle's engine dominated the plane for nearly two thousand strides about the base of the rock. All attempts to move siege engines to within range have been met with a hail of rocks from the fortress's trebuchet, resulting in smashed machines and dead men. The engineers have been forced to concede that constructing a machine of their own, powerful enough to remain out of range of the castle's war engine, while still being able to hit the fortress, was probably impossible. So they would tunnel to near the castle rock, open a pit, and construct a small but powerful siege engine there, under the noses of the castle's garrison, and, supposedly, under the angle at which the castle's trebuchet could fire. There were rumours that this absurd machine would be a sort of self-firing bomb device, some sort of explosive contraption that would throw itself into the air, up past the cliff and against the castle walls, detonating there. Nobody really believed these rumours, though the slightly more plausible idea of constructing a sufficiently powerful wooden catapult or trebuchet in a pit excavated at the end of a tunnel seemed just as fanciful and idiotic. Perhaps they were expected to tunnel up inside the castle rock when they got to it, burrowing up through solid stone, or maybe they were meant to place a gigantic bomb against the base of the rock. These seem no less absurd and pointless as tactics. Maybe the high command, immeasurably distant from this far, and if rumour was to be believed increasingly irrelevant, front, had been misinformed regarding the nature of the castle's foundations, and thinking that the fortress's walls rested on the plain itself, had ordered the mining as a matter of course imagining that the walls could be sapped conventionally, and nobody nearer to the reality of the situation had thought or dared to tell them that this was impossible. But then, who knew how the high commanders thought? The toy put one fist to the small of his back as he stood looking out to the distant fortress. He was trying to stand up straight. It was getting harder to do so each day, which was unfortunate, as slouching was looked on unfavourably by officers, especially by the young junior captain, who seemed to have taken such a dislike to him. Vatoy looked at the litter of grey-brown tents which made up the camp. Above, the clouds looked washed out, the sun hidden behind a grey, dully glowing patch over the more distant of the two ranges of hills that defined the broad plain. Stand up straight, Vatoy, the junior captain told him, emerging from the major's tent. The junior captain was dressed in his best uniform. He'd had Vatoy put on his best gear too, not that his best was very good. Well, don't malinger here all day. Get in there and don't take forever about it. This doesn't get you off anything, you know. Don't go thinking that. You've still got a shift to finish. Hurry up. The junior captain clouted Vatoy about the ear, dislodging his forage cap. Vatoy bent to retrieve it, and the young captain kicked his behind, propelling him through the flap and into the tent. Inside, he collected himself, straightened, and was shown where to stand in front of the board of officers. Conscript Vatoy, number, he began. We don't need to know your number, conscript, one of the two majors told him. There were three senior captains and a colonel present too, an important gathering. Just tell us what happened. He briefly related prizing the rock away from the face, 
sticking his head through the hole and smelling that strange, cave-like darkness, hearing and seeing the water running in the channel beneath, then wriggling back to tell the junior captain and the others. He kept his gaze fixed somewhere above the colonel's head, looking down only once. The officers nodded, looked bored. A subaltern took notes on a writing pad. Dismissed, the more senior major told the toy. He half turned to go, then turned back. Permission to speak further, sir? he said, glancing at the colonel and then the major who'd just spoken. The major looked at him. What? He straightened as best he could, stared above the colonel's head again. It occurred to me the conduit might contribute to the castle's water supply, sir. You're not here to think, conscript, the major said, though not unkindly. No, the colonel said, speaking for the first time. That occurred to me, too. It's still a long way, sir, the junior major said. We've poisoned all the nearer sources, the colonel told him, to no obvious effect, and it is from the direction of the nearer hills. The toy risked nodding at this to show he had thought this, too. With their many springs, the senior major said to the colonel, apparently sharing some private joke. The colonel looked at the toy through narrowed eyes. You were with the cavalry once, weren't you, conscript? Yes, sir. Rank? Captain of Mount, sir. There was a pause. The colonel filled it himself. And? Insubordination, sir. Down to conscript Tunler? You must have been spectacularly insubordinate. So it was adjudged, sir. There was a grunt that might have been laughter. At the colonel's instigation, the officerial heads were brought together. There was some muttering. Then the more senior major said, There will shortly be a small exploratory force sent along the water tunnel, conscript. Perhaps you might care to be on it? I'll do as ordered, sir. Uh, the men will be hand-picked, though volunteers. The toy drew himself up as straight as he could, his back complaining. I volunteer, sir. Good man. You might need a crossbow as well as a shovel. I can handle both, sir. Report to the senior duty officer. Dismissed. The calf-deep water was cold, swirling round his boots and seeping into them. He was fourth man back from the lead, lamp extinguished. Only the lead man had a lit lamp, and that was turned down as low as it would go. The water tunnel was oval-shaped, just too broad to touch both sides at the same time with outstretched arms. It was nearly as tall as a man. You had to walk with head lowered, but it was easy enough after so long being bent double. The air was good, better than in the mining tunnel. It had flowed gently into their faces as they'd stood in the water, ready to move off from the breach leading from the mining tunnel. The twenty men in the detail moved down the partially filled pipe as quietly as they could, wary of traps or guards. They were led by a fairly old, sensible-seeming captain and a very keen young subaltern. There were two other tunnellers as well as himself, both more powerful than he, though with less combat experience. Like him, they carried picks, spades, bows and short swords. The larger of the two other tunnellers also carried a pry bar slung across his broad back. These two men had been chosen by the young junior captain. He had not been happy that Vatoy was being allowed to go on the exploration of the water tunnel while he himself was not. Vatoy expected further unsubtle persecution when he returned if he returned. They came to a place where the tunnel narrowed, and horizontal iron bars ran across the channel, set at heights that meant they had to clamber over them one at a time. Then came a section where the floor of the tunnel angled down, and they had to brace themselves, two by two, each with a hand on one wall, to stop themselves from slipping on the slimy surface under the water. The tunnel all but levelled out again after that. Then another set of bars in a narrow section appeared out of the gloom, again followed by another downward sloped section. He had not dreamed this, he realised as he walked. This was easier than anything he had imagined in his nightmares, or, as it felt, that they had imagined for him. They might stroll all the rest of the way to the castle without having to dig another spadeful. Though, of course, the way might be blocked or guarded, or might not lead to the castle after all. And yet the water was here, in this carefully constructed tunnel. And where else would it be going on this otherwise near-deserted plain if not to the castle? Guards or traps were more likely, though even then the castle was so old that perhaps those within just drew the water unthinkingly from a deep, seemingly unpoisonable well 
and knew nothing of the system that brought it to them. Better to assume that they did know, though, and that they, or the Waters Tunnel's original designers and builders, would have set up some sort of defence against enemies making their way down it. He started to think about what he would put in place if he had been in charge of such matters. His thoughts were interrupted when he collided softly with the back of the man in front. The man behind him piled into his back too, and so on down the line, as they came to a halt, almost without a sound. A gate, the subaltern whispered. Looking ahead, over the shoulder of the man in front, the toy could just make out a broad grating filling the tunnel ahead. The single lamp was turned up a little. The water sieved itself between thick bars of what appeared to be iron. There was more whispering between the captain and the subaltern. The tunnelers were called forward and were confronted by the grating. It was locked shut against a stout, vertical iron stanchion immediately behind. It looked like it was designed to hinge back towards them and then up towards the ceiling. A strange arrangement, the toy thought. All three tunnelers were ordered to light their lamps, the better to inspect the lock. It was about the size of a clenched fist, the chain securing it made of links thick as a little finger. It looked rusted, but only slightly. One of the other tunnelers lifted his pickaxe, testing his swing and where the point might strike to break the lock. That will be noisy, sir, the toy whispered. The sound will travel a long way down the tunnel. What do you suggest? Bite it? the younger officer asked him. Try to lever it off with the pry bar, sir, he said. The senior officer nodded. All right. The tunneler with the pry bar brought it over his shoulder and wedged it under the lock, while Vatoy and the other miner held it out from the grating, angling it just so to increase the effect. Then, once their comrade had taken the strain, joining him to pull hard on the end of the bar. They strained for a few moments to no effect beyond a faint creaking sound. They relaxed, then pulled again. With a dull snap and a loud clank, the lock gave way, sending the three of them falling backwards into the water in a clattering tangle. The chain rattled down into the water to join them. Scarcely quiet, the subaltern muttered. They picked themselves up, sorted themselves out. No sticks or branches or anything against it, one of the other men said, nodding at the foot of the grating. Settle in pool further back, another suggested. Through the grating, the toy could see what looked like stony blocks in the path the water took beyond, like square, narrow stepping stones filling the base of the tunnel. Why would you put those there? he wondered. Ready to raise it, the captain said. Sir, the two tunnelers said together, taking aside each, arms thrust into the dark water to pull at the foot of the grating. Eve, lads, the officer told them. They pulled, and with a dull scraping noise the grating hinged slowly up. They shifted their grip as it rose and pushed it towards the ceiling. The toy saw something move on the ceiling, just behind the slowly moving grill. Wait a moment, he said, perhaps too quietly. In any event, nobody seemed to take any notice. Something, some things, each big as a man's head, fell, one glinting in the lamplight from the ceiling. They smashed on the edges of the raised blocks beneath, and dark liquid came pouring out of them, as their jagged remains vanished into the moving water. It was only then that the men hauling up the grating stopped. Too late. What was that? somebody asked. The water around the blocks where the liquid had entered was bubbling and fuming, sending great grey bubbles of gas to the surface of the water, where they burst, producing thick white fumes. The gas was rising quickly into the air, starting to obscure what view there might have been down the tunnel beyond. It's just... somebody started, then their voice trailed away. Back, lads, the captain said, as the fumes drifted closer. That might be... back, lads, back! The toy heard water sloshing as some of them started to move away. The pale fog now almost filled the place where the grating had been. The men nearest it, the two tunnelers, stood back, letting go of the grill. It crashed down into the water. One of them took a step back. The other seemed transfixed by the sight, remaining close enough to sniff the milky grey cloud. He started coughing immediately, doubling up, hands on knees. His lowered head met a long, silky strand of the gas at waist level, and he wheezed suddenly, standing up and coughing again and again. He turned and waved down the tunnel, then seemed to have a seizure. He fell to his knees, clutching at his throat, eyes wide. His breath rattled in his throat. The other tunneler moved towards him but was waved away. 
the fellow slumped back against the wall of the tunnel, eyes closing. A couple of the other men, also now near to the advancing cloud, started to cough as well. Almost as one, they started to run, suddenly pounding down the tunnel, slipping and sliding and falling, the surface underfoot that had supported slow and steady steps with barely a slip turning to something like ice as they tried to run through the calf-deep water. A couple of them pushed past the toy, who had not yet moved. We will never get past the narrow places with the bars, he thought. We won't even make it up the slopes before them, he realized. The cloud was flowing up the tunnel at a moderate walking pace. It was already at his knees, rising to his groin. He had taken a deep breath as soon as he'd seen the dirty-looking bubbles rising out of the water. He let it out, took another one now. Some of the others were shouting and screaming as they ran away up the tunnel, though the principal noise was a frenzied splashing. The cloud of gas enveloped the toy. He clamped his hand over his mouth and nose. Even so, he could smell something sharp, choking. His eyes began to sting, his nose to run. The grating would be too heavy, he thought. He stooped, felt for it, then, with an effort he would not have believed himself capable of, lifted it in one movement and swung himself beneath it, stumbling through the water beyond as he let the grill go. His boots crunched on shattered pieces of glass under the surface of the water. He remembered to lift his feet for the blocks the bottles had smashed on. The grey cloud was all around him like a cloak. His eyes were stinging and starting to close up seemingly of their own volition. He stepped quickly over the blocks, staggered into the water on the far side, then ran as fast as he could into clear air beyond, his lungs feeling as though they were about to burst. Somehow, he managed to delay breathing until he could see no trace of the grey mist, either in the air or rising in bubbles from the water. He could hardly see, and the first deep, heaving breath he took stung first his mouth and then his throat all the way down to his lungs. Even the exhalation seemed to sting his nose. He took more deep, deep breaths, standing doubled over with his hands on his knees. Each breath hurt, but stung less than the one before. From up the tunnel, he could hear nothing. Eventually, he was able to breathe sufficiently freely to move without gasping. He looked back into the darkness and tried to imagine the scenes he might find, walking back to the breach, once the gas had cleared. He wondered how long that would take. He turned and made his way in the other direction, towards the castle. Guards found him hollering at the far end, where a vertical well shaft descended to a deep pool. Taken before the castle authorities, he informed them that he would tell them anything they wanted to know. He was just a humble tunneler who'd been lucky and resourceful enough to evade the trap which had claimed the lives of his fellows. But he knew of the scheme to tunnel to near the castle and set up some sort of compact but powerful siege engine. And additionally, he would tell all that he could about the little he knew of the disposition, numbers, and quality of the forces besieging the castle, if they would but spare his life. They took him away and asked him many questions, all of which he answered truthfully. Then they tortured him to make sure he'd been telling the truth. Finally, uncertain where his loyalties might lie, unwilling to support yet another mouth to feed and judging his torment-broken body of little practical use, they trust him and fired him from the giant trebuchet in the great tower. By chance, he fell to earth not far from the tunnel he had helped dig, landing with a thump that some of his old comrades heard above them as they tramped back to camp after another back-breaking shift, stopping up one tunnel and continuing with their own. His last thought was that he had once dreamed of flying. Chapter 3 It was some time before Yaim Nsoki realized she was the last one left firing. The orbital's hub had been the first thing to go blitzed in an instant by a staggeringly bright camburst before there had been any warning whatsoever. Then the hundred or so major ships moored beneath the O's outer surface, contained within bulkhead range docks or approaching or leaving the orbital, had been destroyed in a single synchronized scattergun blaze. Mines precisely obliterated by exquisitely focused line gun loci, their already cram-packed substrates collapsing into particles more dense than neutron star material. All that prized wit intelligence and knowledge almost beyond measuring, snuffed, in every case, to a barely visible ultra-dense cinder, almost before they had time to realise what was happening to them. While the shockwaves from the gravity point collapses were still propagating through the victim vessel's internal structures and hulls, they were slammed with meticulously graded degrees of further destruction. 
The craft within, or very close to the O, targeted with small nukes and thermonuclear charges sufficient to destroy the ships themselves without compromising the strategic structure of the orbital itself, while those further out were simply smithereened with antimatter warheads. Their megaton bodies slashed across the outboard skies in blinding pulses of energy that threw jagged shadows across the vast internal surfaces of the world. All of this in a handful of seconds. A heartbeat later, the independent high AI defensive nodes overseeing each of the O's original plates had been knocked out with pinpoint plasma displacements, and simultaneously, the few thousand nearby interstellar-class ships were attacked, meeting their fates in a grotesque parody of size seniority. First the larger, more capable craft vanishing in nuclear or thermonuclear explosions, then the second rank ships moments later, followed by smaller and smaller vessels until all those were gone and the blossoming waves of annihilation moved on to target the slowest in-system craft. Finally, the semi-slaved AIs, dotted at random throughout the fabric of the entire bracelet world, had stopped communicating all at once. The weapon systems that they had fallen heir to, as the higher-level control processes had been destroyed, either subsiding to dormancy or actively starting to attack whatever defensive capability there was left. Drones and humans, taking command of independently controllable weapon and munition delivery systems, made up what was left. The few machines and people in the right place at the right time, scrabbling to take over from the blitzed machines even as they were struggling to comprehend what was happening to their world. Its end, Yaim and Soki thought, as she'd careened down a drop shaft from the travel tube interchange she'd been in as the attack began. She'd bounced into the little blown diamond bubble of the ancient plasma cannon's backup control blister, in time to be almost blinded by a detonating in-system clipper ship less than a millisecond away. The diamond's outer protective film barely having time to switch to mirror and her own eyes reacting late, leaving her with dots dancing in her eyes, as well as the blush of an instant radiation tan warming her face. Not the end of the world, though, she thought, as she settled into the seat and felt the restraints close around her. Not destroying the O itself, just everything about it. Probably the end of my world, though. This doesn't look survivable. She tried to remember when she'd last backed up. Months ago. She wasn't even sure. Sloppy. She kicked the gun's systems out of network and into local control, dumbing its systems down to minimally interferable with hardened optic communication with atomechanical backup readied and mirroring, then flicked antiquely solid switches on a control panel, creating a great hum and buzz all around her as the thirty-meter turret woke up. Screens bright, controls alive. She brought the bulky helmet over her head, checked it was working on visual and audio and that there was air in the mask component, then left it in place for added protection as much as anything, while the gun's ancient control comms established direct links with her neural lace. Systems designed and code-written millennia apart met, made sense, and established rules and parameters. It was a strange, invasively unpleasant feeling like a spreading itch inside her skull she could not scratch. She felt the lace using her drug glands to jink her already quickened senses and reactions up to one of her pre-agreed maxima. Felt like the setting was deterioration within minutes and burnout in less than a quarter of an hour. Ah, the very quickest, the all-out emergency mode. That wasn't encouraging. Her own lace was giving her just a handful of minutes to be of use as a fully functioning component of the orbital's last-ditch defence. Outside. Grippings and pressings all over her body, like being nuzzled by a few dozen small but powerful animals, confirmed that the gun control blister's protective armour had enfolded her. She and the gun were as ready as they'd ever be for what came next. She stared out into the darkness, senses enhanced to the point of nearly painful distraction, as she searched for anything that wasn't basically culture stuff getting wasted. Nothing visible, appreciable at all. She established hardened comms links with a few other people and drones, all of them within the limit of this section's original plate boundary. Her fellow warriors were shown as a line of blue telltale lights on a screen at the lower limit of her field of vision. They quickly determined that none of them knew what was happening, and nobody could see anything to fire at. Almost immediately, there was a hoarse scream, quickly cut off, and one light turned from blue to red, as a compromised high kinetic cannon picked off another plasma turret a thousand kilometres away. Five hundred clicks spinward, a drone controlling a line gun with links to a skeen sensing field reported nothing happening on the skeen either, save for the fallback waves following the initial pulses that had wrecked the ship minds.
Whoever it is, they want the O, one of the humans said, as they watched the spread of detonating sparks that were just a few of the nearby in-system craft meeting their ends. The ship's deaths outshone the stars, replacing the familiar constellations with bright but fading patterns of their own. Her lace stepped her awareness speed down to a level where something like normal speech was possible. Grunts on the ground, another agreed. Maybe they'll just drop into the surface, displace onto the interior, Yaim suggested. Maybe. Edgewall stuff can place for that. Anybody in touch with any Edgewall firepower? Nobody was. They had no contact with the O's interior at all, or with any independent craft, or with anybody manning the defences anywhere else. They busied themselves with scanning with what sensors they had access to, checking and readying their own weaponry, and trying to establish contact with survivors further afield. In the darkness, the wrecks of the last in-system craft winked out, brief fires exhausted. Around Yime's position, a few travel tube cars dropped away into the night as people tried to save themselves by using the cars as lifeboats. On average, they got about ten clicks out before they were picked off, too. Quick, tiny eruptions of light pinpricking the black. Anything? Somebody began. Got something, the drone with the scheme sent sent, too quick for speech. Her lace kicked her awareness speed up to maximum. So quickly, the last syllable of the previous speaker's word went on for many seconds providing an impromptu soundtrack to what was happening in the skies beyond. The ships were popping into existence, just a few thousand clicks out, travelling at between one and eight percent of light speed. No beaconry, IFF or any signal at all, not even trying to pretend they were anything else but hostile. Thinking these are targets, somebody communicated. Over the still open voice comm channels came a high-pitched whine like something charging. A first glance indicated hundreds of the ships. A second, thousands. They filled the sky, darting like demented fireworks in as many different directions as there were craft. Some accelerated hard. Some slowed to almost stationary, seemingly within seconds. Those incoming zipped in and were a few tens of clicks out and closing fast before there was time to get more than a few shots off. The drones, Yime thought. The drones will be reacting fastest, firing first. She swung the ancient plasma turret directly outwards found a target, and felt the antique machine's senses and hers agree, lock and fire in the same instant. The old turret trembled, and twin pulses of light lanced out, missing whatever it was they were aiming at. Plenty more targets, she thought, as she and the gun swung fractionally, retargeted, set for a wider beam spread and fired again. Something blazed within the cone of beam filaments, but there was no time to celebrate as she and the gun swung again and again, flicking minutely from side to side and up and down like something trembling, uncertain. There were more bursts of fire within the targeting focus, and there was a certain desperate exultation in just firing, firing, firing. But in some still calm part of her mind, she knew they weren't getting more than a percent of the attacking craft, and the rest were still closing or had arrived. Something at the lower limit of her vision attracted her attention. She watched the last of the little blue telltale lights turn red. All gone. So quickly. She was the last one, she realised. The last one left firing. The view hazed, quivered, started to die. She killed the link systems, swept the helmet back over her head as its screens went blank, and, staring out into the night through her own eyes and the invisible diamond blister, yanked the manual controls from the arm squabs and hauled the turret round to fire at a fast-approaching bright dot just starting to take on substance. There was a thump that somehow felt nearby, back here by the turret, not out there where she was aiming, and the impression of something just outside the diamond bubble. She clicked a switch to let the gun's atomechanical brain do its own targeting and turned her head. The things... Scrabbling towards the turret across the O's outer surface looked like metallic versions of a human ribcage plus skull, running and bouncing on six multiply jointed legs. Bizarrely, they appeared to be racing across the surface as though they were experiencing the equivalent of gravity drawing them down against it, rather than its exact opposite. She was still reaching for the control seat's hand weapon when one of the creatures launched itself at the bubble, smashed through it and landed where her lap would have been had she not been swaddled in the turret's control blister armour. The air in the diamond bubble left in a burst of white vapour that disappeared almost instantly as the skull-faced creature, a machine she saw, stuck its face up to hers, and despite the lack of atmosphere and no visible method of producing the sound, said very clearly, 
Drill over. She sighed, sat back, somewhere else entirely, as the shattered control blister, the crippled plasma turret itself, and the doomed orbital dissipated like mist around her. It was unpleasant, distressing, and of little practical use, Yao and Soki told her drill supervisor sternly. It was a punishment drill, a simulation for masochists. I saw little point to it. Granted, it is about as extreme as they get, her supervisor said cheerfully. All out quick tech, complete surprise attack, just short of total orbital destruction. Hevel Kostril was an elderly looking gent with dark skin, long blonde hair, and a bare chest. He was talking to her in her apartment via a wall screen. It looked like he was on a sea vessel somewhere, as there was a large expanse of water in the background, and his immediate surroundings, a plush seat, some railings, kept tipping slightly this way and that. The screen display was in 2D by her choice. Yaim and Soki didn't hold with things looking too much like whatever they were not. Instructive, though, don't you think? No, she told him. I failed to see the instructional element implicit in being subject to a completely unstoppable attack, and thus being utterly overwhelmed in a matter of minutes. Worse things happen in the real wars, Yaim, Kostrel told her with a grin. Faster, more complete destruction. I imagine simulations of those would have even less to teach, apart from the wisdom of avoiding such initial condition sets in the first place, she told him. And, I might add, that I also fail to see the utility of causing me to experience a simulation in which I harbour a neural lace, given that I have never possessed one, and have no intentions of ever having one. Kostril nodded. That was propaganda. Neural laces are just useful in that sort of extremity. Until they too are corrupted and possibly the person invested by the device as well. He shrugged. By that time, the game's pretty much up anyway, you'd imagine. Yaim shook her head. One that might equally well imagine otherwise. Whatever. They'll let you back up really easily, he said reasonably. But that is not a life choice I have chosen to make, Yaim informed him frostily. No, oh, well, Kostril sighed, then accepted a long drink from somebody just out of shot. He raised it to her. Till next time. Something more practical, I promise. Till then, she agreed. Strength in depth. But the screen was already blank. She said, Claw's screen, anyway, telling the relatively dumb house computer to kill any link at her end. Yaim was entirely untroubled by intelligent house systems, but did not wish to be subject to one. She was happy to admit to feeling a degree of satisfaction that she was, by some orders of magnitude, the most intelligent entity within her immediate surroundings in general, and her own living space in particular. It was not a claim one could convincingly make in very many culture dwellings. Probain Fultessa Yaim Leutzen Soki Dam Volsch much preferred to be known only as Yaim and Soki. She had moved away from her home orbital, and so her name now lacked utility, no longer working as even an approximate address. Worse. Bearing the name of one location while living in another felt to her like something close to deceit. She walked over to the window, picked up a plain but functional brush from a small table, and continued to brush her long hair, which was what she had been doing meticulously when the emergency militia drill alert had come through on her personal terminal, and she had, reluctantly, had to submit to the induction collar and the resulting horribly realistic sim of the orbital even if it wasn't this orbital, but a more standard, less militarily prepared orbital, being so thoroughly savaged and so easily taken over. Outside the oval window she stood at, only very slightly distorted by the sheer thickness of the crystal and other materials forming the glazing, the view was of rolling, grassy countryside, punctuated with numerous lakes and strewn with forests, woods, copses and individual trees. All the windows in Yaim's apartment looked out in roughly the same direction, but had she been looking from any other apartment on this level, the view would have been much the same, plus or minus hazy views of mountains, inland seas and oceans, with no other buildings visible at all, beyond the occasional distant lakeside villa or drifting houseboat. Despite this, Yaim lived in a city, and although the construction she lived in was fairly substantial, a kilometre tall and perhaps a tenth of that across, it itself was not the totality of the metropolis, forming only a small part of it and being nowhere near the most impressive of its buildings. But then it was nowhere near any of the other buildings of the city. The building was part of a distributed city, which to the naive or uninformed eye looked remarkably like no city whatsoever. Most culture cities, where they existed at all, resembled giant snowflakes, 
with greenery, or at least countryside, in whatever colour or form, penetrating almost to the heart of the conurbation. Had its major buildings been gathered together on the same patch of ground, this city, Erval, on the orbital called Dinyol Hay, would have looked more like some vision of the far future from some time in the enormously distant past. It was almost entirely composed of great, soaring, sleek skyscrapers, hundreds or thousands of metres tall, generally slimly conical or ellipsoid in appearance, and looking uncannily like ships or starships, as they had once been called. Fittingly, the buildings were exactly that. Ships, fully capable of existing and making their way in space between stars, should the need ever arise. All the thousand or so major cities on Dinyol Hay were composed in the same way, from hundreds of giant buildings that could happily double a spacecraft. It was a truism that, as a scientific society progressed, its ships gradually ceased to be strictly utilitarian designs, in which almost every part was in some way vital to the running of the craft. Normally. They went through an intermediate stage where the overall conception was still limited by the necessities imposed by the environment in which the vessels travelled, but within which there was considerable opportunity for the designers, crew, and passengers, inhabitants, to fashion them pretty much as they pleased before, usually some centuries after the gross vulgarity of rocket power, simple space travel became so mature a technology it was almost trivial. At this point, practically anything not messily joined to lots of other important stuff. Could be quite easily turned into a space-capable craft able to transport humans or any other species spectacularly maladapted to hard vacuum and the somewhat industrial radiation environment generally associated with it. Two, at the very least, different parts of the same stellar system. A standalone building was almost laughably easy to convert. A bit of strengthening and rigidizing, some only semi-scrupulous sealant work. Throw a gel coat over the whole thing as well, just to be doubly sure. Strap on an engine unit or two somewhere, and you were away. In the culture, you could even dispense with sensory and navigation systems. Stay within a light year or two of the nearest orbital, and you could navigate with your own neural lace, even an antique pen terminal. It was DIY space travel, and people did exactly that, though always to the surprise of those just on the brink of contributing to the relevant statistics. The results made it one of the more dangerous hobbies pursued with any enthusiasm within the culture. The means then were readily to hand. The motive behind the sort of building Yaim now stood in was simply survival. Should some catastrophe befall the orbital itself, its inhabitants could escape the place in what were essentially giant lifeboats. The principle had swung in and out of fashion. At one point, very early in the culture's history, many thousands of years ago, such high redundancy safety consciousness. Had been the fairly strictly followed rule. It fell from favour as habitat and especially orbital design, construction and protection rose to levels that pretty much guaranteed that those who lived in them had nothing catastrophic to worry about. Then came very rapidly back into fashion when the Idiran War had gone from being an almost unthinkable absurdity through being an unlikely joke to seemingly without warning becoming a terrifying tangible reality. Suddenly. Whole systems full of orbitals and their vast populations had found themselves at a firing line they had never even imagined might exist. Nevertheless, almost all the humans most at risk, and even a few deeply wise machines, convinced themselves that no sentient spacefaring species would actually attack a habitat the size of an orbital. Certainly not with the intention of destroying it. By universal agreement, almost completely irrelevant militarily, an O was simply a beautiful place for lots of people to live. As well as being an elegantly devised and artistically detailed cultural achievement, why would anybody attack one? Developing civilizations and barbarian underachievers aside, things had been acutely civilized and agreeably quiet in the greater galaxy for centiaeons. A working consensus regarding acceptable behavior between the involved had long since been arrived at. Intercultural conflict resolution was a mature technology. Pan-species morality. Had quite entirely moved on from the unfortunate lapses of days gone by, and outright destruction of major civilizational assets was rightly seen by all as inelegant, wasteful, counterproductive, and apart from anything else, simply shrieking of shamefully deep societal insecurity. This entirely civilized and not unreasonable assumption 
proved ill-founded when the adherents, thinking to make it very clear to all concerned who were the fanatical, invincible ultra-warriors in the matter, and who represented the hopelessly decadent, simpering, irredeemably civilian bunch of martial no-hopers merely playing at war, attempted to traumatise the culture straight back out of their newly begun war by attacking and attempting to destroy every orbital its war fleets could reach. An orbital was just a fabulously thin bracelet of matter, three million kilometres in circumference orbiting a sun. The apparent gravity on its interior surface provided by the same spin that gave it its day-night cycle. Break one anywhere around its ten million kilometres circumference, and some were only a few thousand kilometres across, and it tore itself apart, unwinding like a released spring, dumping landscape, atmosphere and inhabitants unceremoniously into space. All this came as something of a surprise. Natural disasters occurring to an orbital were almost unheard of the systems they inhabited having generally been cleared of wandering debris to form the material from which the O itself had been constructed. And even the most carefree, socially relaxed orbitals packed a healthy variety of defensive systems, easily able to pick off any remaining rocks and ice lumps that might have the temerity to approach. However, against the sort of weaponry the adherents, amongst many others, possessed, orbitals were both effectively defenceless and hopelessly vulnerable. When the Adiran ships fell upon the orbitals, the culture was still mostly reminding itself how to build warships. The few warcraft and militarised contact ships it was able to put in the way of the attacks were swept aside. Tens upon tens of billions died. And all for nothing, even from the Adiran point of view. The culture, insufficiently traumatised perhaps, conspicuously failed to retreat from the war. Orders obeyed, damage duly inflicted, the Adiran war fleets fell back to more martially relevant, not to say honourable duties. Meanwhile, the culture, arguably to its own amazement as much as anybody else's, had hunkered down, gritted what needed to be gritted, did the same regarding girding, and to the chorus of umpteen trillion people telling each other stoically, it's going to be a long war, got grimly on with putting itself onto a proper war footing. In the immediate aftermath of the attacks, many orbitals, generally those closest to the action, were simply evacuated. Some were militarised, to the extent this made sense, given they were so enormous and, patently, as had just been proved, fragile in the face of modern weaponry. Many were just left to revolve, empty, effectively mothballed. Some were destroyed by the culture itself. Orbitals could be moved, and some were, but it was an excruciatingly long-winded business. There was even, for this whole shifting out of danger procedure, what was effectively a thing called a waiting list, a term and concept many devoutly pampered culture citizens had some trouble getting entirely to grips with. Regardless, having lots of pleasantly fitted out buildings which could double as luxury lifeboats suddenly made unimpeachable sense. Even orbitals almost certainly unreachably far away from the conflict took up the new construction trend, and giant skyscrapers, usually reassuringly sleek and ship-like in form, blossomed like colossal, suddenly fashionable plants across the culture's orbitals. Distributed cities came about when it was realised that even having the buildings, uh, ships, physically close to each other on the surface of an O was unwise, should an attack take place. Keeping them far apart from each other made the enemy's targeting similarly distributed and confused. Fast, dedicated travel tube lines in hard vacuum under the O's outer surface connected the buildings of any city cluster preferentially and directly making the average journey time between buildings of any given city as quick or quicker than walking a conventional city block. The absolute need to live in such cities, or even such buildings, had long since passed, unless you were cautious to the point of neuroticism, even paranoia. But the fashion still ebbed and flowed a little, and throughout the fifty trillion people and many millions of orbitals in the culture, there would always be enough people and orbitals who still liked the idea for it never entirely to disappear. Some people just felt safer in a building that could casually survive even the destruction of an orbital. Yime was one such person. It was why she lived in this building and on this orbital. She combed her hair slowly, thoughtfully, looking out of the porthole window but not really seeing the view. She thought Kostril was not a particularly good supervisor for even a part of an orbital's emergency militia force. Ineffective, altogether too lackadaisical. It was disgraceful that hardly anybody on most orbitals even knew that such organisations existed. Even here, on staid, careful, buttoned-up, backed-up, fastened-down and just plain cautious Dinyol Hay, almost nobody was interested in such things. They were all too busy having fun. 
Attempts had been made before to get people more involved in last-ditch orbital defense techniques, but to little avail. It was as though people just didn't want to think about such things. It was obviously so important. Odd. Perhaps the problem was that it had been so long since there had been a proper, thorough-going war. It had been fifteen hundred years since the Adiran conflict. Within living human memory, for only the most determinedly so-called immortalists, of whom there were surpassing few, and who were anyway usually too obsessed to themselves to care about warning others what real warfare was like. Minds and drones who'd been involved were also surprisingly reluctant to share their experiences. Still, there had to be a way. The whole approach needed shaking up, and she might be just the person to make it happen. She doubted Kostril was up to it. Why? He hadn't even bothered to reply in kind when she'd signed off with strength in depth. How rude! She decided she would have to see about deposing Mr. Costrell from his post and having herself elected in his place. One hundred and twenty-five, one hundred and twenty-six. She'd almost reached her set number of morning hair brushings. Yaim had thick, lustrous brown hair, which she kept in what was called an eye cut. Every hair on her head. Kept at a length such that when it was pulled round towards either eye, it was just too short either to obstruct her field of vision or otherwise cause annoyance. A chime from her terminal, in the shape of a slim pen lying on another table, interrupted her reverie of power. She realized, with an undignified lurch in her insides, that the particular tone the terminal had used meant it was a call from Quietus. She might actually be going to work. Even so. She completed the last two hair-brushing strokes before answering. One had to have rules. Chapter Four. In Valley Three Hundred Eight, which was part of the thrice-flayed footprint district of the Pavulian Hell, Level Three, there was an old-fashioned mill with a tall external overshot wheel, powered by blood. It was part of the punishment of some of the virtual souls in that place that each day they be profusely bled. For as long as they could, without falling unconscious, there were many thousands of such unfortunates to be bled during each session, and they were duly dragged, screaming from their nearby pens, by grotesquely formed, irresistibly powerful demons, and strapped to canted iron tables with drains at their foot. These tables were arranged in serried ranks on the steep banks of the arid valley, which, had one been able to look at it from far enough above, would have been revealed as a ridge forming part of a truly gigantic footprint. Hence the district's name. The once very important person to whom the flayed hand belonged was still, in some sense, alive, and suffered every moment from having had their skin removed. They suffered in a magnified sense too, concomitant with their pelt having been so grotesquely scale exaggerated that a single ridge on one of their feet or paws, there being some fairly irrelevant disagreement concerning the correct terminology. Was now vast enough to form part of the landscape on which so many others lived their post-death lives and suffered the multitudinous torments which had been prescribed them. The released blood from the iron tables ran glutinously down pipes and runnels to the stream bed where it collected, flowed downhill as liquids are prone to do, even in entirely virtual environments, and ran with increasing vigor and force as the blood of more and more sufferers paid tribute to the stream down to a deep, wide pool. Even there, bound by the synthetic rules of the hell, it resolutely refused to coagulate. From the header pool, a broad channel directed it to the summit of the mill's wheel. The wheel was constructed of many, many ancient bones, long bleached white by the action of the acid or alkali rains that fell every few days and caused such torment to the people held in the pens upstream. The wheel. Turned on bearings made of cartilage, laced with the nerves of yet more of the condemned whose bodies had been woven into the fabric of the building, each creaking, groaning revolution of the wheel producing seemingly unbearable agony. Other sufferers made up the roof slates with their oversized, painfully sensitized nails. They too dreaded the harrowing rains, which stung with every drop, or the mill's thin walls with their painfully stretched skins. Or its supporting beams with their protesting bones, or its creaking gears and cogs, every tooth of which hurt as though riddled with disease, every stressed and straining bone, bar and shaft of which would have screamed had they possessed voices. Far beyond, beneath boiling dark skies, the stream gave out onto a great blood marsh, 
where sufferers planted and rooted like stunted trees, drowned again and again with every acidic rain and each fresh wash of blood. Much of the time, the mill didn't even use the flow of blood collecting in its upstream pool. The fluid simply went on down the overflow and back to the stream bed on its way to the dark swamp in the distance beneath the darkly livid, lowering skies. And besides, the mill powered nothing. The little energy it produced when it did deign to function went entirely to waste. Its whole purpose and point was to add to the excruciation of those unfortunate enough to find themselves within hell. This was what people were generally told, anyway. Some were told the mill did power something. They were told it held great stone wheels which ground the bodies and bones of those guilty of crimes committed within hell. Those so punished suffered even greater agonies than those whose bodies still, in some sense, resembled those they had inhabited before death. For those who had sinned even within hell, the rules, always entirely flexible, were changed so that they could suffer with every sinew, cell, and structure of their body, no matter how atomized it might have become and how impossible such suffering would have been with an utterly shredded nervous central system in the real. The truth was different, however. The truth was that the mill had a quite specific purpose, and the energy it produced did not go to waste. It operated one of the small number of gates that led out of hell, and that was why the two small pavilions sheltering on the far side of the valley were there. No, we are lost, entirely lost, Prin. We are where we are, my love. Look, the way out is right there in front of us. We are not lost and we shall shortly escape. Soon we'll be home. You know that is not true. That is a dream, just a dream, a treacherous dream. This is what is real, not anything we might think we remember from before. That memory is itself part of the torment, something to increase our pain. We should forget what we think we remember of a life before this. There was no life before this. This is all there is, all there ever was, all there ever will be. Eternity. This is eternity. Only this is eternity. Surrender to that thought, and at least the agony of hope that can never be fulfilled will disappear. They were crouching together, hidden within the lower part of a cheval de frise, its giant X of crossed spikes laden with impaled, half-decayed bodies. Those bodies, and the bodies all around them littering this section of hillside, indeed the seemingly living or apparently dead bodies of everybody within the hell, including their own, were pavulian in form. Meter and a half long quadrupeds, with large round heads from which issued small twin trunks, highly prehensile proboscises with little lobes at the tip resembling stubby fingers. Agony of hope. Listen to yourself, Che. Hope is all we have, my love. Hope drives us on. Hope is not treachery. Hope is not cruel and insane like this perversion of existence. It is reasonable, right, only what we might expect what we have every right to expect. We must escape, we must, not just for selfish reasons, to escape the torments we've been subjected to here, but to take the news, the truth of what we've experienced here, back to the real, back to where, somehow, someday, something might be done about it. The two pavilions, presently hiding under the covering of rotting corpses, were called, in the familiar form they used with each other, Prin and Che and they had journeyed together across several regions of this hell, over a subjective period of several months, always heading for this place. Now, finally, they were within sight of it. Neither resembled pavulians in the peak of health. Only Prin's left trunk was intact. The other was just a still ragged stump after a casual swipe from the sword of a passing demon some weeks ago. The poisoned sword had left a wound that would not heal or stop hurting. His intact left trunk had been nicked in the same strike and made him wince with every movement. Around both their necks was a twist of tightened barbed wire like a depraved version of a necklace, the barbs biting through their skin, raising welts that seeped blood and left itching, flaking scabs. Che limped because both her hind legs had been broken just days after they'd entered the hell. She had been run over by one of an endless line of bone and iron juggernauts transporting mangled bodies from one part of the hell to another. The juggernauts moved along a road whose every cobble was the warted, calloused back of screaming unfortunates buried beneath. Prin had carried her on his back for weeks afterwards while she healed, 
though the bones in her legs had never set properly. In hell, bones never did. You are wrong, Prim. There is no real, there is no outside reality, there is only this. You may need this delusion to make the pain of being here less for you, but in the end, you will be better off accepting the true reality, that this is all there is, all there ever has been and all there ever will be. No, Che, he told her. At this moment we are code. We are ghosts in the substrate. We are both real and unreal. Never forget that. We exist here for now, but we had and have another life, other bodies to return to, back in the real. Real, Prim. We are real fools. Fools to have come. If what you say is true and we came from somewhere else, fools to think we could do anything of use here. And most certainly fools to think we can ever leave this ghastly, filthy, sickening place. This is our life now. Even if there was another one before it, accept it, and it may not be so terrible. This is the real. This that you see and feel and smell around you. Che reached out with her right trunk, and its tip almost touched the partially rotted face of a young female, impaled face down on the spikes above, her emptied eye sockets staring blankly in at the two people cowering beneath. Though terrible it is. So, so terrible. Such a terrible place. She looked at her mate. Why make it worse with a lie of hope? Prin reached out with his surviving trunk and wrapped it around both of hers as best he could. Chea Lee's Hiffon's daughter, it is your despair that is the lie. The bloodgate across this valley opens within the hour to let out those who've been allowed a half-day glimpse of hell in the hope of making them behave better back in the real. And we have the means to leave with them. We shall. We will go back. We will leave this place. We will return to our home, and we will tell of what we've seen here. We'll let the truth of it out forever, free into the real, to do whatever damage to this outrage upon kindness and sentience it is possible to do. This vast obscenity around us was made, my love. It can be unmade. We can help. We can begin that unmaking. We can. We will do this. But I will not do it alone. I can't and won't leave without you. We go together or not at all. Just one last effort. Please, my love, stay at my side. Come with me. Escape with me. Help me save you and help me save myself. He hugged her to his chest as hard as he was able. Here come Osteophagus, she said, looking out over his shoulder. He let her go and looked round, peeking and hanging rotting limbs to the uphill entrance to their impromptu shelter. She was right. A detail of half a dozen osteophages were moving down and across the barren hillside, dragging bodies off the cheval de frise and the other spiked and barbed barriers that littered the slope. The osteophages were specialist demons, flesh and bone eating scavengers who lived off the carcasses of those re killed, either in hell's never ending war, or just in the normal course of its perpetual round of mutilation and pain. The souls of those they ate would already have been recycled into fresh, mostly whole if never entirely healthy bodies, better able to appreciate the torments in store for them. Like almost all the demons in the Pavulian hell, the osteophages resembled predator beasts from the Pavulian evolutionary past. The osteophages moving down the hillside towards where the two small Pavulians were hiding looked like glossily powerful versions of animals that had once preyed upon Che and Prin's ancestors millions of years earlier. Four-legged, twice the size of a pavulian, with big, forward-facing eyes and, again like most demons, perversely sporting two more muscular versions of pavulian trunks from the sides of their massive, crushing jaws. Their shining pelts of bright red and yellow stripes looked lacquered, polished. The colours were as much a hellish amendment as the trunks that the original animals had never possessed. It gave them the bizarre look of having been coloured in by children. They moved, hulkingly from barbed barrier to barbed barrier along the hillside, lifting the hooked bodies off with their trunks or tearing them free with vicious-looking teeth nearly half a trunk long. They sucked down what were obviously the more prized parts, crunching on some smaller bones on occasion. But most of the bodies they collected were thrown onto ill-made bone carts, pulled by blinded, detrunked pavulians 
following them along the valley side. They will find us, Chase said dully. They will find us and kill us all over again. Or part eat us and leave us here to suffer, or impale us upon these hideous works, and come back for us later, or break our legs and throw us up onto one of their carts, and take us to more senior demons for more refined and terrible punishment. Prin stared out at the advancing ragged line of demons, mutilated pavilions and giant carts. For a few moments he was unable to think properly, unable to take stock of their suddenly changed situation, and allowed Che to mutter on letting her words leech away the hope he had been trying to fill her with, letting her fill him instead with the despair he was constantly trying to hold at bay, and which he could never admit to her was forever threatening to overwhelm him. The detail of osteophages and their grisly retinue had come close enough now to hear the crunch of bones in massive jaws and the whimper of the bridled pavilions. He turned and looked in the opposite direction, towards the mill with its dark pool and the thick, unsplashing stream of blood that was now powering the giant, creaking wheel. The mill was working. It had started up. The gate it controlled must be about to open, and the way out of hell would present itself to them at last. Che, look, Prin told her, using his trunk to turn her away from the view of the advancing line of osteophages and towards the mill. I see it. I see it. Another flying death machine. He wondered what she was talking about, then saw the moving shape dark grey upon the still darker grey of the low, restlessly moving clouds. I meant the mill. It's working. But the flyer, too. It must be bringing the ones who are meant to get out. We're saved. Don't you see? Don't you get it? He turned her towards him again, tenderly using his trunk to bring her round to him. This is our chance, Che. We can, we will get out of here. He gently touched the barbed wire necklaces they each wore. First hers, then his own. We have the means, Che. Our lucky charms. Our little kernels of saving code. We brought these with us, remember? They did not put these on us. This is our chance. We must be ready. No, you're still a fool. We have nothing. They will find us. Give us to the superiors in the machine. The flyer was in the shape of a giant beetle. It buzzed furiously towards the mill on a blur of iridescent wings its legs extending as it approached a shaved level patch of ground by the building's side. <laughs> che, you're wrong, my love. We are destined to get out of here. You're coming with me. Keep a hold of your horrible necklace. This bob, this one right here. Here, can you feel it? He directed two of her still perfect, still unscarred, undamaged trunk fingers to the control bob. I feel it. When I say so, you pull hard on that. Do you understand? Of course I understand. Do you think me a fool? Only when I say, pull hard. We shall look like demons to those who are demons themselves and have their power. The effect will not last long, but long enough to get us through the gate. The great beetle-shaped flyer was settling on the patch of ground by the mill. A pair of demons, yellow and black striped, emerged from the mill to watch it land. The beetle's fuselage body was about half the size of the mill, lower, longer, darkly sleek. Its wings settled, folded into its carapace. The rear of its abdomen hinged down, and a small group of sturdy, grinning demons and quivering, obviously terrified pavilions in rough-looking clothes came out. The pavilions' clothes alone marked them out as different here. In hell, all suffered naked and any who tried to cover their nudity only ensured themselves further torments as punishment for having had the effrontery to imagine they could exercise any control whatsoever over their suffering. The eight pavilions exiting the giant beetle were also distinguished from the damned around them by being whole, carrying no scars or obvious injuries, seeping wounds or signs of disease. They looked well-fed, too, though even from this distance Prin could see a sort of hungry desperation in their movements and their facial expressions. A petrifying sense of probably being about to escape this landscape of pain and terror, but with the realization dawning on at least some of them, that perhaps they had been lied to. Perhaps this was not the end of a brief warning tour of hell, designed to keep them on the straight and narrow back in the reel, but rather a taste of what was about to become their settled and already inescapable fate. A cruel trick that would be just the first of innumerable cruel tricks. 
Perhaps they were not getting out at all. Perhaps they were here to stay and to suffer. From what Prynne knew, for at least one of their number, this would be brutally true. Such groups were inevitably traumatised in the course of what they were forced to witness during these tours, and, utterly unable to establish any rapport with the rapaciously forbidding and utterly disdainful demons who escorted them, quickly drew together, bonding like a tiny herd, finding a rough but real companionship amongst their equally horror-struck companions, no matter how various their personalities, situations and histories might have been back in the real. To then have one of your number cut out of your little group, somebody you knew and felt some camaraderie towards, made the experience all the more vivid. It was just about possible to experience one of these horrific excursions and convince yourself that the unfortunates you saw suffering were quite different from you just because of the extremity of their degradation. They appeared sub pavulian little more, perhaps no more, than animals. But to watch one of your group, having all of his or her worst fears confirmed, consigned to everlasting torment just at the point when they thought they were about to be allowed to resume their life in the real, made the lesson the tour was meant to teach stick much more thoroughly in the mind. They're about to go in. Be ready. Prynne glanced back to see the nearest osteophagia alarmingly close to their hideout. We have to go now, my love. He'd hoped to be closer when they made their approach, but there was no choice. Pull on the barb now, Che. So you still seek to deceive me, but I've seen through your shallow hope. Che, we have no time for this. I can't do it for you. It only works at your own touch. Pull the fucking barb. I will not. I will press it instead. See? She winced as she pressed the barb further into her own neck, the other end impaling the tip of her trunk finger. Prin sucked in his breath so hard and fast he saw the nearby osteophage turn its massive head in the direction of their shelter, ears twitching, gaze flicking this way and that, then settling on them. Shit, right. Prin pulled on his own necklace's barb. The contraband code it symbolised started running. Instantly, he had the body of one of the grinning demons, and the biggest and most impressive type at that. A giant, six-limbed predator long extinct in the reel, trunkless, but with trefoil-fingered forelimbs that doubled as trunks. The rationalising rules of the hell immediately caused the body-laden cheval de frise to rear up to accommodate his suddenly increased bulk so that he wore it on his broad green and yellow back, like some monstrous piece of armour. Che cowered at his feet, suddenly small. She voided her bladder and bowels and curled into a rigid ball. With one forelimb, he picked her up by both of her trunks, the way he had seen demons do to his kind countless times before, and with a roar, shrugged the cheval de frise off his back, letting it thunk down to one side, bodies and parts of bodies flopping and falling from its spikes. There was a shrill scream. One of the carts, carrying the corpses, had been almost alongside, hidden by the weight of bodies on that side of the device, and when it had fallen, one of its spikes had pierced the foot of the pavulian hauling the cart, pinning the creature to the ground. The osteophager, who had been looking suspiciously in their direction, took a step back, its ears suddenly bolt upright, an emotion between surprise and fear evident in its stance. Prin snarled at it. The creature took another half-step back. Its fellows across the hillside had stopped and now stood motionless, looking on. They would wait and see which way this was going to go, before deciding either to join in with Leave Some For Me Bravado, or pretend it had been nothing to do with them in the first place. Prin shook the still catatonically inert Che towards the osteophager. She's mine! I saw first! The osteophager blinked, looked round with apparent unconcern, checking to see what the rest of its detail was doing not coming bounding to its side to face down this sudden interloper steadfastly and together, clearly. The creature looked down, brushed at the ground in front of it with the back of one paw, claws mostly retracted. Take it, it said, in a grumbling, seemingly unconcerned voice. Consider it yours with our blessing, we have plenty. It shrugged, lowered its head to sniff at the patch of ground it had scuffed, apparently having lost interest in the whole exchange. Prin snarled again, clutched Che to his chest, turned and bounded down the hillside past decaying corpses and spikes, penanted with ragged strips of flesh. He splashed through the dark stream of blood and went springing diagonally up the slope towards the mill. The group from the giant beetle had disappeared inside the building. 
The beetle itself had closed its abdomen and was unpacking its wings from beneath its gleaming wing covers. Prin was close enough to see demons moving inside its enormous faceted eyes. Pilots, he thought. For an assemblage of code that might as well have been kept aloft through the wielding of an enchanted feather, or a magic anvil for that matter, he leapt on up the hillside towards the mill. Chapter 5 From somewhere came the idea that there were many different levels of sleeping, of unconsciousness, and therefore of awakening. In the midst of this pleasant, woozy, calm, warm, pleasantly swaddled, self-huggingly curled up, a sort of ruddy darkness behind the eyelids, it was an easy and comforting thing to contemplate the many ways one might be away and then come back. You fell asleep just for an instant sometimes, that sudden nod and jerk awake again, lasting a moment. Or you had short naps, often self-timed, limited by knowing you had a few minutes or a half hour or whatever. Of course you had your classic good night sleep, however much things like shift systems and all-night facilities and drugs and city lighting might sometimes interfere. Then there was the deeper unconsciousness of being knocked out, put carefully under for some medical procedure, or randomly banging your head and briefly not even knowing your own name. Also, people still lapsed into comas, and came out of those very gradually. That must be an odd feeling. And for a while there, for the last few centuries, though not so often these days because things had moved on, there was the subsleep of deep space travel, when you were put into a sort of deep, long-term hibernation for years or decades at a time, kept frigidly cold and barely alive, to be revived when your destination approached. Some people have been kept like this back at home, too awaiting medical advances. Waking up from something like that must be quite a strange thing, she thought. She felt an urge to turn over, as though she was nestled in a fabulously comfortable bed, but now had spent enough time on this side and needed to shift to lie the other way. She felt very light, she realised, though even as she thought this, she seemed to feel very slightly reassuringly heavier. She felt herself take a deep, satisfying breath and duly turned over, eyes still tightly closed. She had a vague feeling that she didn't entirely know where she was, but it didn't bother her. Usually, that was a slightly disturbing sensation, occasionally even a very disturbing, frightening experience, but not this time. Somehow, she knew that wherever she was, she was safe, cared for, and in no danger. She felt good. Really good, in fact. When she thought about it, she realised that she couldn't remember ever having felt so good, so secure, so happy. She felt a tiny frown form on her face. Oh, come on, she told herself. She must have felt like this before. To her slight but undeniable irritation, she had only a vague memory of when she had last felt anything like this untroubled and happy. Probably in her mother's arms as a little girl. She knew that if she woke up fully, she would remember properly, but, much as a part of her wanted to be completely awake, to answer this question and sort all this out, another part of her was too happy just lying here, wherever she was, drowsy, secure, and happy. She knew this feeling. This was often the best bit of any day, before she had to wake and fully face the realities of the world and the responsibilities she had fallen heir to. If you were lucky, you really did sleep like a baby, completely soundly and without care. Then it would be only as you awoke that you were reminded of all the things you had to worry about, all the resentments you harboured, all the injustices and cruelties you were subject to. Still, even the thought of that grim process somehow couldn't destroy her mood of ease and happiness. She sighed a long, deep, satisfying sigh, though still with an element of regret as she felt her sleepiness drift away like mist under a gentle breeze. The sheets covering her felt outrageously fine, almost liquidly soft. They moved about her naked body as she completed the sigh and stirred a little under the warm material. She was not sure that even himself possessed such fine... She felt herself spasm and jerk. A terrifying image, the face of someone hateful, started to form before her, then, as though some other part of her mind came to soothe her fears, the fear subsided, and the anxiety seemed to be brushed away, like dust. Whatever she had once feared, she didn't need to fear it now. Well, that was nice, she supposed. She supposed, too, 
that she really ought to wake up. She opened her eyes. She had the vague impression of a wide bed, pale sheets, and a large, high-ceilinged room with tall open windows from which gauzy, softly billowing white curtains waved out. A warm, flower-scented breeze stirred around her. Sunlight lent in golden shafts against the window apertures. She noticed that there was some sort of fuzzy glow at the foot of the bed. It swam into focus and spelled out the word simulation. Simulation, she thought, sitting up and rubbing her eyes. The room swam properly into focus when she reopened them. The place looked perfectly, entirely real, but she was no longer really paying attention to the room. Her jaw had dropped. And her mouth hung open as she took in what she had glimpsed, as she'd casually raised her arms and hands to her eyes a moment earlier. She dropped her head very slowly, and brought her hands up in front of her face again, staring at the backs, then at the palms of her hands, then at her forearms, then down at what she could see of her chest and breasts. She leapt back, upwards to the headboard of the bed, throwing the sheet off her as she did so, and stared down at her naked body. She brought her hands up yet again. Stared hard at them, inspecting her fingers, her fingernails, peering at them as though trying to see something which was almost but not quite too small to see. Finally, she looked up, her gaze darting round the room. She threw herself out of the bed. The word "simulation" stayed where it was, just visible at the bottom of her field of vision, and ran to a full-length mirror between two of the tall windows with their softly billowing curtains. Nothing on her face either. She stared at herself. First of all, she was entirely the wrong colour. She ought to be almost soot black. Instead, she was. She wasn't even sure what you called this colour: dirty gold, mud, polluted sunset. That was bad enough, but there was worse. Where the fuck is my intaglia? She heard herself say. Simulation said the word, now hovering around her feet. As she took in the view of a beautiful but entirely unbodymarked, pale-skinned young woman standing naked in front of her, it looked something like her, she supposed, in bone structure and general bodily proportions, but that was being generous. Her featureless skin was a sort of wan, reddish gold, and her hair was entirely wrong, far too long and much too dark. Simulation, the word still said. She slammed one fist into the side frame of the mirror, felt pretty much exactly the amount of pain she'd have anticipated, and sucked warm, fragrant air through her teeth. Her teeth were also unmarked, too uniformly white, as were the whites of her eyes. When she'd hit it, the mirror frame had wobbled, and the whole mirror and its base had shifted a few millimeters along the polished wooden floor, slightly altering the angle it presented to her. Ow! 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 She muttered, shaking her tingling hand as she stepped to the nearest window. And ducking a little, armed away the delicate translucence of a curtain. She looked out from a bowed, balustraded stone balcony, a floor above ground, gazing across a sunny landscape of elegantly sculpted green and blue trees, pale yellow-green grass, and some mist foregrounding a soft tumult of wooded hills. The furthest ridges, distance blued against high, faraway mountains, summits glittering white. A river sparkled in the yellow-white sunlight off to one side, beyond a meadow where a herd of small, dark-coated animals were grazing. She stared hard at the view. She stepped back, snatched at the floating expanse of the wispy curtain, bringing a section of it up to her nose, frowning at it as she inspected the precision of its near microscopic weave. A set of shutters and glass windows lay open behind. She caught another glimpse of herself in the windows. She shook her head. How strange the hair on her head made the movement feel! Then went down on one knee by the stone balcony rail, rubbing two fingers along its ruddy broad top, feeling the slight graininess of sandstone under her fingertips, a little of which remained when she lifted her fingers away and rubbed them against each other. She put her nose to it; she could smell the stone. Still, simulation, the word said. She let out another sigh of exasperation this time. And inspected the sky with its many little puffy white clouds. She had experienced simulations before. She had been in virtual environments, but even the ones that relied on you being dosed with just the right drugs so that you did a lot of the detail filling yourself were nothing like as perfectly convincing as this. The simulations she had experienced were closer to dreams than reality, 
convincing at the time, but pretty much the moment you started looking for the pixels or the grain or the fractals or whatever they were, or just the processing shortcuts and inconsistencies, you found them. What she was looking at here, and feeling and smelling, was effectively uncannily flawless. She almost felt faint for an instant, head briefly swimming before quickly clearing again, before she even started to sway or stagger. Nevertheless, the sky was too blue, the sunlight too golden, the hills, and especially the mountains, didn't quite fade and drop away like they did on a real planet, and while she still felt entirely like herself within herself, as it were, she was inside a body which was perfectly, flawlessly unmarked, causing her to feel more naked than she'd ever felt in her life. No intaglia, no tattoo, no markage whatsoever. That was the biggest clue of all that this could not be real. Well, the second biggest, there was that word, floating in red, always at the lower limit of her vision. Simulation. That was about as unambiguous as you got, she supposed. From the balcony, she took a look around what she could see of the building. Just a big, rather ornate, red sandstone house with lots of tall windows, some sticky out bits, a few turrets, a pathway of small stones around the base. Listening carefully, she could hear what might be the breeze in the nearest treetops, some high, slightly plaintive calls that probably represented birdsong, and a faint lowing from the herd of four-legged grazing animals in the meadow. She walked back into the bedroom and stood in its relative silence. She cleared her throat. All right? It's a simulation. Anybody here I can talk to? No answer. She drew in the breath to say something else, but then there came a polite knocking from one of the room's two broad wooden doors. Who's there? she called. My name is Sensia, a pleasant-sounding female voice said. She'd have guessed it belonged to a relatively elderly woman, and one who was smiling as she spoke. She'd had a favourite aunt who sounded like this person, though perhaps not quite as well spoken. One moment. She looked down at herself. She imagined wearing a plain white dressing gown. Nope, her body remained stubbornly naked. What looked like a tall wooden wardrobe stood near the door. She swung open the doors, wondering why she was doing so even as she did it. She was in a simulation. This didn't even look like her own body anyway, and she had never been especially self-conscious about her physical form. How could she be as an intagliate? The notion would have been hilarious if not so intimately connected with bitterness. Still, she did feel exceptionally naked with no markings and the general feel and polite, highly moneyed ambience of this sim would appear to demand a certain decorum. There were lots of rather gorgeous clothes inside the wardrobe. She threw on a plain dark blue robe of what felt like the same material the liquid soft sheet had been made of. She stood before the broad door, cleared her throat again, drew herself up, and pulled on the fist-sized handle. Hello, said the rather plain, but very amiable-looking lady of late middle age, standing outside. Behind her was a broad hallway with more doors leading off on one side and balustrades giving out onto a double-level hall on the other. May I come in? She had bunned white hair, sparkling green eyes, and was dressed in a plain dark suit, unadorned. Please do, she said. Sincere looked around, softly clapping her frail-looking hands once. Shall we sit outside? I've sent for some drinks. They dragged a couple of heavy, brocaded seats out through the middle window onto the most generous of the room's balconies and sat down. Her eyes stay too wide, she found herself thinking. She's facing into the sunlight. A real person would be squinting by now, wouldn't they? On a ledge above, two small birds appeared to be fighting, rising at each other on a furious flutter of wings and almost touching breasts in midair before falling back again. All of this accompanied by a great deal of high-pitched twittering. Sincere smiled warmly, clasping her hands. So, she said, we are in a simulation. I gathered, she said, the word itself seemingly printed across the legs of the woman opposite. We'll remove that, Sincere said. The word disappeared from her field of vision. That felt briefly scary, though presumably she was always going to be under somebody's control in a sim. Sincere sat forward. Now, this might sound a little odd, but would you mind terribly telling me your name? She stared at the other woman, 
Just for the merest instant, she had to think. What was her name? Uh, Ladeja Ibrek, she said, almost blurted. Of course. Thank you. I see. Sincere looked up towards the mad tweeting coming from the little birds above. The noise stopped suddenly. A moment later, both birds flew down, settled briefly on one of Sincere's fingers, and then darted off in different directions. And you are from where exactly? Another nearly imperceptible delay. Well, I, I'm of the Vepers retinue, she said. Vepers, she thought. How odd to think of him without fear. It was as though all that was in another life, and one that she would not have to go back to. Even as she thought about it, turning it over in her mind, the idea still held no terror. She started trying to remember where she had been last before she ended up here. It felt like something she'd been hiding from herself, like something that some other part of her had been keeping from her. I was born in Ubruata City and brought up in the mansion house of the estate of Aspasium, she told Sincere. Lately, I still generally live either in Ubruata, Aspasium, or sometimes just wherever Mister Vepers might be. Sincere was nodding, gaze distant. Aha, she said, sitting back, smiling. Ubruada City, Sichult, Queen System, Ruprin Cluster, Arm One One near Tip. Ledeja recognized Quinn as the name the sun went by in the rest of the galaxy, and she had heard the term Ruprin Cluster before. She had no idea what Arm One One near Tip was. This bit of the galaxy, she supposed. Where am I? She asked, as a small, thick-bottomed tray arrived, floating out from the room. It held glasses and a pitcher of pale green liquid with ice in it. The device lowered between them so that it effectively became a table. Sincere poured their drinks. Presently, literally, she said, settling back again, swirling her drink. You're in a computational substrate node of the general system's vehicle, sense amid madness, wit amidst folly, which is currently traveling through the Lyavitsian blister in the region called God's Ear Rotational. Rather than fully catching all this, Ledeja had been thinking, "Vehicle," she said. "Is that a wheel?" Or she took a drink. The pale green liquid was delicious, though probably non-alcoholic. Sincere smiled uncertainly. "A wheel?" "You know, a wheel," Ledeja said, and became aware they were now staring at the other with mutual incomprehension. How could this woman not know what a wheel was? Then Sincere's face brightened. Ah, a wheel, a specific thing with a capital letter and so on. I see. Yes. Sorry, got you now. She looked away, seemingly distracted. Oh yes,、uh, fascinating things. She shook her head. But no, not a wheel. Bit bigger than that. Plate class general systems vehicle, getting on for a hundred kilometers long if you go tip to tip of the outer field structure, and four clicks high, measuring just the naked hull, roughly six trillion tons. Though the mass SA gets fiendishly complicated with so much exotic matter making up the engines, about a fifth of a billion people aboard right now. She flashed a smile, not counting those in virtual environments. What's it called again? The sense amid madness, wit amid folly. Sensia shrugged. Where I take my name from, Sensia. I'm a ship's avatoid. That sounds like a culture ship, Ledeja said, feeling her skin warm suddenly. Sensia stared at her, looking genuinely surprised. Good gracious, she said. You mean you didn't even know you were on a culture ship, even within the culture at all? I'm surprised you're not more disoriented. Where did you think you might be? Ledeja shrugged. She was still trying to recall where she'd been last before she woke up here. No idea, she said. I've never been in a sim this good. I'm not sure we have them to this standard. I don't even think Vepers has them this detailed. Sincere nodded. Where am I really? Ledeja asked. How do you mean? Where's my real self? My physical body? Sincere stared at her again. She put the drink down on the floating tray, her expression unreadable. Ah, she said. 
She made an O with her mouth and sucked air in, turning her head to look out at the parkland surrounding the house. She turned back to look at Ledeja. What is the last thing you remember before you woke up here? Ledeja shook her head. I can't remember. I've been trying. Well, don't try too hard. From what I can gather, it's traumatic. Ledeja wanted to say something to that, but couldn't think what. Traumatic, she thought with a sudden shiver of fear. What the hell did that mean? Sincere took a deep breath. Let me start by explaining that I have never had to ask for somebody's name in these circumstances. I mean someone, you, suddenly popping into existence unannounced. She shook her head. Doesn't happen. Mind states, souls, dynamic full-brain process inventories, whatever you call them, they always come with copious notes. You didn't. Sincere smiled again. Ledeja formed the uncomfortable impression that the other woman was trying hard to be reassuring. This had never proved to be a good sign in Ledeja's past, and she seriously doubted the pattern was about to change now. You just immaterialized here, my dear, Sincere told her. In a one-time, one-way, emergency entanglement, vicariously inherited legacy system event of what us minds would generally call laughably high unexpectancy. And, most bizarrely of all, you came with what one might call no paperwork. Zero documentation. Absolutely without accompanying context material. Docketless. Is that unusual? Sincere laughed. She had a surprisingly deep, almost raucous laugh. Ledeja found herself smiling despite the apparent gravity of the subject. Not so much unusual, Sincere said, more entirely without precedent in roughly the last fifteen hundred busy years. Frankly, I'm finding that hard to believe myself, and trust me, I have lots and lots of other avatars, avatoids, agents, feelers, and just plain old requests out at the moment asking if anybody else has heard of such a thing, all without positive reply so far. So you had to ask me my name? Quite. As a ship mind, as any kind of mind, or even AI, I'm sort of constitutionally forbidden from looking too deeply into you. But even so, I had to do a bit of delving just to get a matchable body profile for you to wake up in without causing you further trauma here in the virtual. Didn't entirely work, Ledeja thought. I'm a negative of my real self's color. And where's my damn tat? Sincere continued. Plus, there's the language protocols, obviously. They're actually quite involved, but highly localized across pan-humanity, so easy enough to pinpoint. Could have gone deeper and got your name and other details, but that would have been invasively rude. However, following some ancient guidelines so obscure that I had to actively dig them out and consult them, designed to cover situations like this, I did what is called an immediate post-traumatic emergency entanglement transfer psychological profile evaluation. Another smile. So that whatever suddenly caused you to need an entanglement event in the first place, back wherever you came from, didn't compromise your safe transfer into virtuality. Sincere raised her glass again. She looked at it, then put it back down again. And what I discovered was that... You've had a traumatic experience, she said quite quickly, her gaze not meeting Ledeja's, which I've sort of held back edited from your transferred memories, just for now. While you settle in, get yourself sorted out. Until you're ready, you know. Ledeja stared at her. Really? You can do such a thing? Oh, trivially easy, technically, Sincere said, sounding relieved. The constraints are entirely moral, rule-based, and it is, obviously, up to you when you come fully up to speed with yourself, if you know what I mean. Though, frankly, if I were you, I wouldn't be in too great a hurry. Ledeja tried very hard to recall what had happened before she came here. She remembered being at Aspersium, walking down a tree-lined avenue in the estate alone, thinking that it was time to escape. Hmm, she thought. That was interesting. Was that what had happened? Had she finally found a practical, vepers proof method of getting away from the bastard and all his money, power and influence, using this entanglement thing? But that still left the question, 
Where was her real self? Not to mention why could she remember so little, and what exactly was this trauma Sincia kept talking about? She drained her glass, sat up straight. Tell me everything, she demanded. Sincia looked at her. She looked worried, concerned, compassionate. Ledeja, she began slowly, carefully. Would you say that you're a psychologically strong person? Oh fuck, thought Ledeja. When she had been very young, there had been a time she could still remember when she had felt nothing but loved, privileged, and special. It was something more than the usual feeling of blessed distinction that all good parents naturally communicate to their children. There was that. That feeling of being at the focus of unquestioning regard and care, but for a while, she'd been just about sufficiently mature to realize that she was lucky enough to have even more than that. First of all, she lived in a great and beautiful house, within a vast rural estate of extraordinary, even unique grandeur. And secondly, she looked utterly different from the other children, just as her mother looked quite different from the other adults in the great household. She had been born an intagliate. She was certainly a human and a Sichultian. You learned early on there were other types of human, but it was taken for granted that Sichultians were the best sort. But more than just a Sichultian, an intaglia, somebody whose skin, whose entire body, whose every internal organ and part of their external physical appearance was different, markedly different from that of everybody else. Intagliates looked like ordinary people only in silhouette or in lighting conditions so poor you could hardly see them at all. Turn on a lamp, come out into the daylight, and they were revealed as the fabulous creatures they were. An intagliate was covered head to foot in what was called a congenitally administered tattoo. Ledeja had been born tattooed, emerging from the womb with the most fabulously intricate patterns indelibly encoded at a cellular level onto her skin and throughout her body. Usually, a true indented intagliate. As fully recognized by the Sichultian judicial and administrative system, was born with mist white skin, the better to display the classically ink dark designs imprinted on them. Their teeth bore similar designs. The whites of their eyes were similarly ornamented. Their translucent fingernails held one design, while another was just visible on the nail pad beneath. The pores on their skin were arranged in a precisely formulated, non-random way, and even the minute tracery of their capillary system was patterned just so. According to design, not developmental chance, cut them open, and you would find similar designs on the surfaces of their internal organs. Their designated motif carried into their heart and guts. Bleach their bones; the design would be stamped on the pale surface of their very skeleton. Suck out their marrow and break those bones open. The ornamentation continued. At every possible level of their being, they bore the mark that distinguished them from the blank sheets that were other people. As well as from those who had merely chosen to have themselves in some way marked, some, especially over the last century or so, were born almost night black rather than nearly snow white. Their skins, especially, laced with even more exotic and colourful designs that could usefully include iridescence, fluorescence, and the effect of mercurial silver, all of which were held to show up better on black skin. The Deja had been one of these even more flamboyantly marked creatures. The elite of the elite, as she'd thought and felt at the time. Her mother, who carried her own marks on her much paler skin, though hers were simple conventional ink, cared for Ledeja and made her feel exceptionally fortunate to be what and who she was. The girl was proud that she was even more fabulously tattooed than her mother, and fascinated both by her mother's wildly swirling patterns and her own. Even then, when she was just little, less than half her mother's height. She could see that, for all the greater area of her mother's body surface and the fabulous artistry of the designs on her skin, her own flesh was the more intricately patterned, the more precisely and minutely marked. She noticed this, but didn't like to say anything, feeling slightly sorry for her mother. Maybe one day, she'd thought, her mother too could have skin as beautifully intagliated as her own. The Deja decided she would grow up rich and famous, and would give her mother the money to make this happen. This made her feel very grown up. When she began to mix with them, the other toddlers and younger children from the estate seemed in awe of her. For one thing, they were each a mixture of colours, and many of them were rather pale and wan-looking. She was pure. More importantly, though, 
the other children had no markings. They boasted no astounding design upon their skins or anywhere else, obvious or hidden, slowly growing, gradually maturing, subtly changing and forever becoming more complicated. They deferred to her, prioritized her own needs and wants over their own, seemed practically to worship her. She was their princess, their queen, almost their sacred goddess. It had changed gradually. She suspected her mother had used all the influence she possessed to protect her only child from the demeaning truth for as long as she'd been able, probably to the detriment of her own position and standing within the household. For the truth was that the Intagliat were more than just human exotica. They were both more and less than extravagant ornamentations in the household and retinue of the rich and powerful, to be displayed like walking, living jewellery at important social events and within the halls of financial, social and political power though they were most certainly that. They were trophies. They were the surrendered banners of defeated enemies, the capitulation papers signed by the vanquished, the heads of fierce beasts adorning the walls of those who owned them. Intagliates recorded with their very being the fall of their families, the shame of their parents and grandparents. To be so marked was to bear witness to an inherited debt which your very existence was part of the paying off. It was a feature of Sichultian law, carried over from the practices of the particular nation caste that had emerged victorious in the fight to stamp their way of doing things on the coalescing world state two centuries earlier, that if a commercial debt could not be fully settled, or if the terms in some deal were deemed not entirely sufficient due to shortage of funds or other negotiables by one of the parties, then the defaulting or inadequately provisioned side could compensate by undertaking to have a generation or two of their progeny made intagliate signing over at least some of their children and grandchildren, usually, though not always, for life, to the care and control, indeed the ownership, of those to whom they were either indebted or at a fiscal disadvantage. Sichultians, on encountering the rest of the galactic community following their contact by a species called the Flecker, were generally quite indignantly insistent that their rich and powerful loved their children just as much as the rich and powerful of any other decently civilized species, and that they simply had an elevated respect for the letter of the law and the honour involved in paying one's debts on time, rather than a reduced regard for the rights of minors or those who were otherwise innocent but indebted by inheritance in general. The rights and well-being of the intagliate, they would point out, were protected by an entire network of strictly applied laws to ensure that they could not be neglected or mistreated by those who effectively owned them, and indeed those who were marked could even be regarded as being amongst the most privileged people in society, in a sense, being raised in the absolute lap of luxury, mixing with the very cream of society, attending all the most important social events and formal court occasions, and never being expected to have to work for their keep. Most people would happily surrender their so-called freedom to live like that. They were esteemed, precious, and almost, though not quite, beyond price. What more could somebody who would otherwise have been born into grinding poverty ask for? Like many societies, finding their hitherto unquestioned customs and ethical assumptions impacting squarely with the breathtakingly sophisticated, summed morality of a meta-civilization inestimably older, vaster, and by implication wiser than themselves, the Sichultia became highly protective of their developmental foibles and refused to mandate away what some of them, at least, claimed to regard as one of their defining social characteristics and a vital and vibrant part of their culture. Not all Sichultians agreed with this, of course. There had always been opposition to the very idea of indented intagliation, as well as to the very notion of a political economic system configured to allow such options. A few deranged ruffians and degenerate trollmakers even took issue with the primacy of private ownership and the unfettered accumulation of capital itself. But most Sichultians accepted the practice, and some were genuinely proud of it. As far as other species and civilizations were concerned, it was just another of those little quirks you always encountered when you discovered a new member of the community, a rough edge that would probably get rubbed off like the rest as the Sichultia gradually found and settled into their place at the great galactic banquet table of pan-species revelry. Ledeja could still remember the dawning of the realisation that her markings were not glorious after all, but somehow shameful. She was imprinted as she was, not to distinguish her as someone more important and privileged than others, but to mark her as a chattel, to make it clear to others that she was less than them, an owned, bonded thing, a trophy, 
an admission of familial defeat and shame. It had been, it still was, the most important, defining and humiliating stage of her life. She had immediately tried to run away, fleeing the nursery where one of the other children, a little older than she, had finally and categorically informed her about all this, but got no further than the base of one of the dozens of small satellite domes that surrounded the mansion, barely a kilometre from where she'd started. She howled and screamed at her mother for not telling her the truth about her tattoo. She threw herself into her bed and didn't emerge for days. Hunkered under the bedclothes, she'd heard her mother weeping in the next room and been briefly glad of it. Later, she hated herself for hating her mother, and they wept together, hugging. But nothing would ever be the same again, either between them or between Ledegia and the other children, whose deposed queen she now felt she was. It would be years before she'd be able to acknowledge all that her mother had done to protect her, how even that first deceit, that absurd concocted dream of privilege, had been a way of trying to strengthen her for the vicissitudes she would inevitably encounter in her later life. According to her mother, the reason that she had been forcibly tattooed and Ledegia had been born in Tagliat, as would be the one or two children she was contractually and honour bound to produce, was that her late husband, Grotz, Ledegia's father, had been too trusting. Grotz and Veppers had been best friends since their school days and had been in business together since the beginning of their commercial careers. Both of them came from very powerful, rich and renowned families, and both became even more powerful, rich and famous as individuals, making deals and making money. They had made some enemies too, certainly, but that was only to be expected in business. They were rivals, but it was a friendly rivalry, and they had many joint ventures and equal partnerships. Then, there came the prospect of a single great deal, more lucrative and important than any they had ever taken part in before. A momentous, reputation-securing, history-making, world-changing deal. They took a solemn pledge that they would work together on this, equal partners. They even became blood brothers to seal the agreement and signify the importance of the deal to both of them. They used a paired set of antique knives that Ledeja's great-grandfather had presented to Vepper's grandfather decades earlier to cut the palms of the hands they then clasped. Nothing had been signed between them, but then the two had always behaved like honourable men to each other and taken the other's word as being good enough. The details of the betrayal and the slow, devastating unwinding of that pledge were such that whole teams of lawyers had struggled to come to terms with them. But the gist was that Ledeja's father had lost everything, and Vepers had gained it all and more. Her father's family lost almost everything too the financial damage rippling out to brothers, sisters, parents, aunts, uncles and cousins. Veppers had made a great show of pretending to be supportive. In the complexity of the unravelling deal, much of the most immediate damage had been at the hands of other business rivals, and Veppers was assiduous in buying up the debts they accumulated from Ledeja's father. But always his support stopped short preventing the damage in the first place. The final betrayal was the requirement, when all other ways of paying had been exhausted, that Grotz consent to his wife being marked, and his next child, and any children that that child had, being an indented intagliate. Veppers gave every sign of being devastated it had come to this, but said he could see no other way out. There was no other honourable course, and if they had not honour, what did they have? He received considerable sympathy for having to watch his best friend and his family suffer so but was adamant that despite the personal anguish it caused him, it was the right thing to do. The rich could not be, and did not want to be, above the law. The first part of the sentence, approved by Sicholt's highest court, was duly carried out. Ledeja's mother was taken, put into something resembling a coma, and tattooed. The night of the day they had taken her away, her husband slit his own throat with one of the two knives the original disastrous agreement had been solemnized by. They found Grotz's body quite quickly. The medics were able to take a viable sample of his seed from him, brought together with an egg taken from his widow while she was still under from the tattooing procedure. The resulting embryo was altered, changed to become that of an intagliate, and then implanted back into his widow. Many of the team who had overseen the designing and patterning of the embryo felt it was their finest work. The result was Ledeja. The basis for the fabulous scrollwork wrapping every square centimetre of her skin, was that of the letter V for Vepers and the Veprine Corporation he commanded. 
Other elements included twin crossed knives and images of the object the fateful deal had been about in the first place. Sichult's soletta, the giant space-mounted fabrication which shielded the world from some of the light of the sun. Ledeja tried running away a lot as she grew up. She never got very far. Around about the time she started to think of herself as a young woman rather than a girl, when her intaglia was revealing itself in its true, mature, astoundingly intricate and colourful glory, she began to realise just how fabulously rich her master, Mr. Veppers, was, and how far his power and influence reached. She gave up trying to run away. It wasn't until some years later, when Veppers started raping her, that she discovered that the richer the alleged perpetrator was, the more all those strictly enforced statutes regarding the rights of the intagliate became, well, more like aspirations general guidelines rather than properly enforced laws. That was when she started trying to run away again. The first time she'd got to the edge of the estate, ninety kilometres from the house, after travelling down one of the great forested trackways that led to the estate perimeter. The day before Ledeja was caught and brought back, her mother, despairing, had thrown herself from one of the towers in the part of the estate near the house Ledeja and her friends called the Water Maze. Ledeja had never confided to her mother that Vepers was raping her. He'd told her after the first time that if she did, he'd make sure she never saw her mother again. Simple as that. She thought that her mother had suspected, though. That might have been the real reason she took her own life. Ledeja felt she understood why death had seemed like an easier course for her mother. She even thought about doing the same thing herself, but couldn't bring herself to go through with it. Part of her, wanted to deprive Veppers of the most monetarily precious person in his household, but a more important part of her refused to let herself be ground down to the point of suicide by him. Losing her mother hadn't been enough, apparently. She'd been physically punished for her attempt to escape, too. A relatively unadorned patch of her flesh at the base of her back had been retro-marked with a beautifully drawn, exquisitely detailed, though to her still inestimably crude etching of a black-skinned girl flitting through a forest. Even the applying of it had hurt. And now, as Sincere slowly let the memories filter back, she knew that the second time she'd escaped had been in the city, in the capital, in Ubruata. She'd got away for longer that time, five days rather than four, though she'd only travelled a couple of kilometres across Ubruata, the adventure ending in the opera house that Vepers himself had funded. She winced, as she remembered the knife entering her chest, sliding between her ribs, plunging into her heart. The taste of his blood, the grisly feel of the tip of his nose as she chewed once and swallowed it, the shrieked obscenity and the final slap across the face when she was already as good as dead. They were somewhere else now. She'd had Sincere turn her skin from reddish gold, too much like Vepper's own flesh tone, to a dark, glossy black. The house and landscape had been altered at her request too, all in an instant. Now they stood outside a more modest single-story dwelling of white-painted mud brick, whose prospect was of a leafy little oasis in a great duned desert of sable sand spreading as far as the eye could see. Colourful tents stood around pools and little streams, shadowed by tall red-leafed trees. Make there be children, she'd said. And there they were, a dozen or so, all laughing and splashing in one of the shallow pools, oblivious to the two women watching them from the mud-brick house on its slight rise. Sincere had suggested they sit down before she opened up Ledeja's memories of the last few days and hours of her life. They had sat on a rug and wooden platform, in front of the house, while she recalled with mounting horror the events leading up to her death. There had been the usual flyer journey from the estate to the capital, full of stomach-churning swoops and zooms as Vepers enjoyed himself. Then, on arrival, she had settled into her room in the townhouse, another mansion in all but name in the centre of the city. Then she'd slipped away from a visit to a couturier, gouging from her left heel the tracer implant she'd discovered was there some months ago. She'd picked up some pre-prepared clothes, makeup and effects, and gone on the run within the city streets and alleys, finally finding herself cornered in the opera house. The way Sincere had let her experience it, it was more like watching it all happen to somebody else, on a stage or in a film. 
She had been spared the outright immediacy of it, all in that first run-through, though she could choose to go back and inspect the detail of it if she wanted. She had chosen to do this. She was doing it again now. She winced once more. Lideja had stood again, the shock of it over. Sencia stood at her side. So, I'm dead? she said, still not fully comprehending. Well, Sencia said, obviously not so dead you can't ask that question, but technically, yes. How did I get here? Was it via this entanglement thing? Yes. There must have been a sort of neural lace inside your head, entangled with the legacy system I inherited from the relevant ship. What relevant ship? Let's come back to that. And what fucking neural lace inside my head? she demanded. I didn't have one. You must have. But the only alternative would have been somebody positioning some sort of neural induction device around your head and reading your mind state that way as you slipped away. But that's very doubtful. Not the sort of tech you have yourselves. We have aliens, Ledeja protested. Especially in Ubruata. It's the capital of the planet, the whole system, the whole enablement. Alien embassies, aliens running around all over the place. They'd have the tech. Indeed they might. But why would they code your brain state and transmit it across three and a half thousand light years to a culture ship without documentation? Also... Just plopping an induction helmet, no matter how sophisticated, onto a dying person in the last few seconds of their life could never record a mind state as detailed and internally consistent as yours. Even in a prime, a tech medical environment with plenty of prep time and a stable subject, you'd never capture the fine detail you've come equipped with. A full backup capable neural lace grows with the brain it's part of. It beds in over the years gets very adept at mirroring every detail of the mind it interpenetrates and coexists with. That's what you pretty much must have had. Plus, it had an entanglement facility built into it, obviously. She glared at Cynthia. So, I'm... complete? A perfect copy? Impossible to be absolutely sure, but I strongly suspect so. There is almost certainly less of a difference between the you that died and the you that you are now than there would be between yourselves at one end of a night's sleep and the other. And that's thanks to this entanglement thing, too. Partly. The copies at either end of the process should be absolutely identical, assuming the non-originating part of the pair collapses at all. What? Entanglement is great when it works, but more than two percent of the time, it doesn't work. In fact, it fails utterly. That's why it's almost never used. Hideously risky. You use it in wartime when it's better than nothing, and possibly a few SC agents have been subject to the process, but otherwise never. Still, the odds were in my favor. Assuredly, and it's better than being dead. Sincere paused. Though this still doesn't answer the question regarding how you ended up with a full backup capable neural lace in your head, complete with an entanglement facility targeted to a long past on legacy subsystem which all concerned had quite thoroughly forgotten about. Sincia turned, looked at Ledeja. You're frowning. I just thought of something. She had met him. Met it, as it turned out at a reception on the third Equitower, in the space station port of one of Sichelt's five equatorial space elevators. A Jalupian cultural and trade mission ship had recently docked, disgorging various notables of the Jalupa, a high-level civilization with which Vepers had commercial links. The carousel space where the reception was held was one of a number of giant sliding tori forever revolving underneath the rotund bulk of the station's docks, canted windows providing an ever-changing view of the planet beneath. The Jalupa, she recalled thinking, gave the impression that they were all elbows, or maybe knees. They were awkward-looking, twelve-limbed creatures like giant, soft-shelled land crabs, their skin or carapace, a bright, lustrous green. A trio of eyes on short stalks protruded from their main bodies, which were a little larger than a human who had rolled themselves into a ball. Rather than use their many spindly legs, they floated in what looked like metallic cushions. Their translated voices issued from the same source. This had happened ten years ago. 
Ledeja had been sixteen at the time, just coming to terms with the fact that she was a woman and that her now almost fully matured intagliation would make her an object of fascination wherever she went. Indeed, that this was the whole of her purpose in life as far as Vepers and the rest of the world were concerned. She had just started being brought along to events like this, expected to accompany Vepers as part of his retinue. It was, in its full pomp, a sizable retinue too. As well as his assorted bag carriers and various bodyguards, Yaskin being the last line of defence, Vepers was the sort of oligarch who seemed to feel slightly naked without his media relations adviser and his loyal Titian around. She still wasn't entirely sure what a loyal Titian actually did, but at least they had some sort of purpose and utility. She, she had come to realise, was no more than an ornament, something to be admired, to be stared at and cooed over an object of fascination and astonishment, her duty being to exemplify and magnify the magnificence and sheer wealth of Mr. Joyler Vepers, President and Prime Executive Officer of the Veprine Corporation, the richest man in the world, in the whole enablement, in charge of the most powerful and profitable company that had ever existed. The man looking at her appeared terribly old. He was either a much-altered Sichultian or a pan-human alien. The human type, had proved to be one of the galaxy's more repetitively common life forms. Probably an alien. Making yourself look as skeletally creakingly old as that would just be perverse, weird, and creepy. Nowadays, even poor people could afford the sort of treatment that let you stay young looking pretty much until you died. It kind of meant you rotted from the inside, she'd heard, but that was a small price to pay for not having to look decrepit until right at the end. And there wouldn't be any poor people up here anyway. This was an exclusive little party, for all that there were a couple of hundred people present. There were only ten of the Jalupa in attendance. The rest were Sichultian business chiefs, politicians, bureaucrats and media people, plus their various servants, aides and hangers-on. She supposed she counted as a hanger-on. She was generally expected to hang around near Vepers, impressing all with the fabulousness of the human exotica he could afford. But he, and his inner negotiating circle, had peeled off to talk with two of the giant crab people in a sort of bay window section of the reception room, perimeter guarded by three of the Zii, Vepa's massive, highly enhanced clone bodyguards. Ledeja had come to understand that often the principal part of her worth lay in providing a distraction, a chattel to be wielded when Vepa's required, dazzling and beguiling those he wished dazzled and beguiled, often so that he could slip something past them or just get them in a generally agreeable frame of mind. The Jalupe might be able to appreciate that she looked significantly different to everybody else around her, darker and extravagantly tattooed, but the Sichultians were so alien to them anyway it made little extra difference, which meant she was not required to be present when Vepers was talking with them on matters of any great seriousness. She had hardly been abandoned, though, being minded by one of the other Zii and in the company of Dr. Zorbazgi. That man is looking at you. Zulbazgi said, nodding towards the slightly stooped, extremely bald human a few metres away. The man looked wrong, too thin and, even stooped, too tall to be normal. His face and head appeared vaguely cadaverous, even his clothes were strange, too tight, plain and dull to be remotely fashionable. Everybody looks at me, Dr. Zulbazgi, she told him. Dr. Zulbazgi was a blocky-looking man with dark yellow skin quite lined on his face, and scant, thin brown hair, characteristics that marked him as either coming from or having ancestors who'd come from Karatii, first among Sichuld's subcontinents. He could easily have had himself altered to look more handsome, or at least vaguely acceptable, but had chosen not to. Ledeja thought this was very strange, even freaky. The Zii, towering nearby, soberly dressed, eyes always moving, flicking his gaze all around the room as though watching some ball game invisible to everybody else, was quite good-looking in comparison, and even he was kind of scarily muscle-blown, looking like he was about to burst out of both his suit and skin. Yes, but he's looking at you differently to everybody else, the doctor said. He nodded to a waiter, had his glass replaced, took a drink. And look, now he's coming over. Ma'am, the Z.I. rumbled deep dark eyes looking down at her from a face at least half a metre above her own. The Zii made her feel like a child. She sighed, nodded, and the Zii let the funny-looking man approach her. Vepers would not expect her to be standoffish with anybody at an event as exclusive as this. 
Good day. I believe you are Ledger Ibrek, the old man said, smiling at her and nodding briefly at Dr. Sulbaski. His voice was real, not synthesized by a translation device. Even more surprising was that his voice was so deep. Veppers had had his voice surgically improved over the years, making it deeper, more mellifluous and rich in a series of small operations and other treatments. But this man's voice eclipsed even Vepper's succulent tones. Bit of a shock in someone so patently an old geezer, and looking like he was on his last legs. Maybe age went differently with aliens, she thought. Yes, I am, she said, smiling suitably and carefully pitching her voice into the middle of the zone of elegance that her elocution tutor kept wittering on about. How do you do? And you are? How do you do? My name is Himerance. He smiled, swivelled from the waist in a slightly unnatural way, and looked over to where Veppers was talking to the two crab-like aliens. I'm with the Jalupian delegation, a pan-human cultural translator, making sure nobody commits some terrible faux pas. How interesting, she said, happy not to be committing one herself by yawning in the geriatric's face. He smiled again, looked down to her feet, and then back up to her face. Yes, just you give me a good long inspection, you old perv, she thought. She supposed it was partly the dress, of which it had to be said there was not much. She was destined to spend her life in revealing clothes. She had long since decided to be proud of how she looked. She would have been a beauty even without the intagliation, and if she was to bear the mark of her family's shame, then she would do that too, with all the dignity she could. However, she was still growing into this new role, and sometimes men looked at her in ways she didn't appreciate. Even Veppers had begun to gaze at her as though he was somehow seeing her for the first time, and in a way that made her uncomfortable. I confess, Himeron said, I am quite fascinated by the Intagliat, and you are, if I may say so, remarkable even within that exceptional category. How kind, she said. Oh. I am not kind, Himeron said. At that point, the Zii watching over them stiffened fractionally and rumbled something that might have been, excuse me, before swinging away into the crowd of people with surprising litheness and grace. At the same time, Dr. Zulbazki swayed a little and, frowning, inspected the contents of his glass. His eyes looked a little odd. Don't know what they're putting in this stuff these days. I think I'll sit down, if you are. <laughs> excuse me. He sidled off too, heading for some seats. There we are, Himeron said smoothly. He had kept his eyes focused on her while both the Zii and Dr. S had made their excuses and left. She was alone with him now. The truth dawned. You just did that? she asked, glancing first at the broad retreating back of the Zii, and then in the direction Dr. S had disappeared. She was not trying to keep her voice politely modulated any more. She was aware her eyes had widened. Well done, Himeron said with an appreciative smile. A concocted semi-urgent message on the bodyguard's comms, and a temporary feeling of dizziness afflicting the good doctor. Neither will detain them for long. However, it allows me the chance to beg a favor of you. Himeron smiled again. I would like to talk to you privately, Ms. Iberic. May I? Now? she asked. She glanced about. It would be a short conversation. You were, well, she was, never left alone for more than a minute or so at gatherings like this. Later, Himerant said. Tonight, in your chamber at Mr. Vepper's townhouse in Uberwara City. She almost laughed. Think you'll get invited? She knew there was nothing planned that evening beyond a meal out with a whole entourage somewhere, and then, for her... Music and deportment lessons, then to bed, after getting to watch half an hour of screen, if she was lucky. She wasn't allowed out without bodyguards and escorts, and the idea that she'd be allowed to entertain a man in her private bedroom, ancient and alien or not, was frankly hilarious. Himerantz smiled his easy smile. No, he said. I can arrange my own access. However, I wouldn't want you to be alarmed. So I thought it best to ask permission first. She regained some control. What is this about, Mr. Himerance? she asked, voice polite and measured again. I have a modest proposition to make. 
It will cause you no inconvenience or harm. It would take nothing from you that you'd miss. She changed tack again, trying to unsettle this weird old guy, dropping the too polite tone and asking sharply, And what's in it for me? Perhaps some satisfaction once I've explained what it is I am looking for, though some other payment could certainly be arranged. Still, without taking his gaze away from her eyes, he said, I'm afraid I must hurry you for an answer. One of Mr. Vepper's bodyguards is making his way towards us rather smartly, having realized we have been left alone. She felt excited, slightly scared. Her life was too controlled. When's good for you? she asked. She'd fallen asleep. She hadn't meant to, and she would never have thought she'd be able to anyway just too fired up by the vague, illicit thrill of it all. Then, when she awoke, she knew he was there. Her room was on the second top floor of the tall townhouse, which was better guarded than most military bases. She had a big room with a dressing room and bathroom en suite. Its two large windows looked out over the gently lit parterres and formal sculptings of the garden. By the windows, part illuminated in the spill of cloud-reflected city light the shutters admitted, there was a sitting area, with a low table, a couch, and two seats. She levered herself up from her pillows with her elbows. He was sitting in one of the seats. She saw his head turn. Mizzy Brick, he said softly. Hello again. She shook her head, put a finger to her lips, pointed round the room. There was just enough light for her to see him smile. No, he said gently. The various surveillance devices will not trouble us. Okay, she thought. So the alarm probably wouldn't work either. She'd kind of been relying on that as her last line of defense if things got iffy. Well, second last line of defense, she could always just scream. Though if the guy could interfere with the ZI's comms, make Dr. S feel suddenly dizzy, and somehow get himself into Vepper's townhouse without being detected, maybe even screaming wouldn't be on the agenda if he set his mind against it. She started to get a little frightened again. A light came slowly on near the seat he sat in, revealing him to be dressed just as he had been at the reception earlier in the day. Please, he said, gesturing to the other seat. Join me. She put a robe over her nightgown, turning away from him so that he wouldn't see her hands shake. She sat by him. He looked different. Still the same man, but not quite so old, less skeletal about the face, body no longer stooped. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to talk with you in private, he said, formally. That's okay, she said, drawing her feet up beneath her and hugging her knees. So, what is it all about? I would like to take an image of you. An image? She felt vaguely disappointed. Was that all? though probably he meant a full-body image, a photograph of her in the nude. So, he was just an old perv after all. Funny how things that started out exciting and maybe even romantic-seeming degenerated into the crude mundanity of lust. It would be an image of your entire body, not just both inside and out, but of its every single cell, indeed its every atom, and taken, in effect, from outside the three dimensions one normally deals with. She stared at him. Like from hyperspace? she asked. Ledeja had generally paid attention in science lessons. Himmerance smiled broadly. Precisely. Why? He shrugged. For my own private collection of images which I find pleasing. Uh -huh. For whatever it might be worth, Ms. Ibrek. I can assure you that my motivation is absolutely not sexual. Right. Himmerance sighed. You are a remarkable work, if I may say so, Ms. Ibrek, he told her. I realize that you are a person, and a very intelligent, pleasant, and, to those of your own kind, of course, an attractive one. However, I shan't pretend that my interest in you is anything other than purely due to the intagliation you have suffered. Suffered? Undergone? I did think about the exact word to employ. No, you were right the first time. I suffered it, she said. Not something I got to have any choice about, anyway. 
quite. What do you do with these images? I contemplate them. They are works of art to me. Got any other ones you can show me? Hemorrhance sat forward. Would you really like to see some? He appeared genuinely keen. Do we have the time? We do. So, show me. A bright 3D image appeared in the air in front of her. It showed... Well, she wasn't sure. It was an insane swirl of lines, black against yellow-orange, bewilderingly complex levels of implied detail disappearing into enfolded spaces it was not quite possible to see. This is just the three-dimensional view one would have of a stellar field line or entity, he told her, though with the horizontal scale reduced to make it look roughly spherical. Really, they look more like this. The image suddenly stretched, teasing out until the assemblage of dark lines she'd been looking at became a single line, maybe a meter long and less than a millimeter across. A tiny symbol, looking like a sort of microscopic shoebox with the edges chamfered off, was probably meant to indicate scale, though as she had no idea what it was meant to represent, it didn't really help. The vanishingly thin line was shown silhouetted against what looked like a detail of the surface of a star. Then the line plumped up to become an absurdly complicated collection of lines once more. It's hard to give an impression of the effect in 4D with all the internals shown, Himmerance said apologetically. But it's something like this. Whatever he did with the image, it left her feeling glad she was sitting down. The image seemed to peel off into a million different slices, sections flickering blurringly past her like snowflakes in a blizzard. She blinked, looked away, feeling disoriented. Are you all right? Himmerance asked, sounding concerned. It can be a bit intense. I'm fine, she told him. What exactly was that? A particularly fine specimen of a stellar field liner. Creatures who live within the magnetic lines of force in mostly the photospheres of suns. That thing was alive? Yes, and it still is, I expect. They live for a very long time. She looked at the old man, his face illuminated by the glow coming from the image of the creature that was mostly black lines and somehow lived on the surfaces of suns. Can you see it in proper 4D? Yes, he said, turning to look at her. He sounded proud and coy at once, face glowing, enthusiasm seemingly pouring out of him. He suddenly looked about six. How is that possible? she asked. Because I am not really a man or any sort of human, he told her, still smiling. I am an avatar of a ship. It is the ship you are really addressing, and the ship which is able to take and appreciate images in 4D. The ship's name, my true name, is the me I'm counting. Once fully part of the culture, now an independent vessel within what is sometimes known as the ulterior. I am a wanderer. An explorer, if you will, and it is my pleasure, on occasion, to offer my services as a cultural translator, a facilitator of smooth relations between profoundly different species and civilizations, to whoever might feel the need for such assistance. And, as I say, I am also a collector of images of whatever I consider to be the most exquisite beings, wherever my travels take me. Couldn't you just take one of these images without me knowing? In the practical sense, yes. Nothing would be easier. But you wanted to ask permission first. It would be rude, dishonorable not to, don't you think? She looked at him for a moment. I suppose, she said eventually. So, would you be sharing this image with anybody? No. Until now, showing you this one of the field liner creature, I have never shared one of these images with anybody. I have many more. Would you like to? No, she said, smiling and holding up one hand. That's all right. The image disappeared, dimming the room again. I give you my word that in the unlikely event I do decide I want to share your image, I would not do so without your express permission. In each case. In each case with a similar precondition applying to, and if you do it, if you take the image, will I feel anything? Nothing. Hmm. Still hugging her shins, she lowered her face to her robed knees, 
stuck her tongue out to touch the soft material, then bit at it, taking a tiny fold of it into her mouth. Hemorance watched her for a few moments, then said, Ledger, may I have your permission to take the image? She spat out the fold of material, raised her head. I asked you before, what's in it for me? What may I offer? Get me out of here. Take me with you. Help me escape. Rescue me from this life. I can't do that, Ledger. I'm sorry. Himmerans sounded regretful. Why not? There would be consequences. She let her head drop again. She stared at the rug at the foot of the shuttered windows. Because Vepers is the richest man in the world? In the whole situlty and enablement, and the most powerful, Himmerans sighed. There are limits to what I can do, anyway. You have your own way of living here on this world and within the hegemony you call the enablement. Your own rules, mores, customs and laws. It is not regarded as good form to go interfering in the societies of others unless one has a very good reason and an agreed-on strategic plan. However much we might wish to, we cannot simply indulge our own sentimental urges. I am genuinely sorry, but sadly... What you ask is not within my gift. So nothing in it for me, she said, and knew that she sounded bitter. I'm sure I could set up a bank account with a sum in it that might help you, like Vepers will ever let me have any sort of independent life, she said, shaking her head. Well, perhaps. Oh, just do it, she said. She hugged her legs tighter, looked at him. Do I need to stand up or anything? No. Are you sure? Just do it. She repeated fiercely. I might still be able to suggest some kind of compensatory. Yes, yes, whatever you think fit, surprise me. Surprise you? You heard. You are sure about this? I'm sure, I'm sure. Have you done it yet? Aha, Sincere purred, nodding her head slowly. That does sound like it. That ship put the neural lace thing in my head. Yes, well, it would have planted the seed of one. They grow. I didn't feel anything at the time. Well, you wouldn't. Sincere looked out towards the desert. Yes, the me I'm counting, she said. And Ledeja got the impression Sincere was really talking to herself. Hooligan class, L-O-U. Declared as an eccentric and altered itself over a millennium ago. Dropped out of view completely a couple of years back. Probably on a retreat. The Dedja sighed heavily. My own fault for saying surprise me, I guess. Inside, though, she was elated. The mystery was solved. Almost certainly. And it had been a good bargain. She had been saved from death, in a sense at least. But what is to become of me, she thought. She looked at Sincere, still staring out into the shimmering warmth of distance where dust devils danced and the horizon quivered in a mirage of lake or sea. What is to become of me, she wondered. Did she depend upon the charity of this virtual woman? Was she subject to some legal agreement between the culture and the enablement? Was she now somebody or something else's possession or plaything? She might as well ask, she supposed. She immediately found herself preparing to use what she thought of as her little voice, the meek, low, soft, childlike tone she used when she was trying to make her own vulnerability and powerlessness known, when she was trying to play upon somebody's sympathies, make them feel sorry for her and so less likely to hurt or demean her, and perhaps even let her have something she wanted. It was a technique she had used on everyone from her mother to Vepers, mostly with a lot more success than failure. But she hesitated. It had never been a ruse she had been very proud of, and here the rules had changed. Everything was different. For her own pride, for the sake of what might be a fresh start, she would ask it straight, without deliberate inflection. So, she said, looking not at Sincere but out at the desert. What is to become of me, Sincere? The older woman looked at her. Become of you? You mean what happens now? Where do you go? Still not daring to meet the other woman's gaze, she nodded. Yes. What a strange, almost absurd situation to be in, she thought. 
To be in this perfect but self-confessed simulation, talking to a glorified computer about her fate, her life from this point on. What would happen next? Would she be left free to wander and somehow make a life within this virtual world? Would she be in some sense returned to Sichel, to even to Vepers? Could she simply be turned off as just a program, nothing genuinely alive at all? The following few seconds, the next sentence out of Sensia's unreal, virtually modelled mouth, would like as not turn her life one way or the other, to despair, to triumph, to outright annihilation. It all came down, unless she was already being deeply deceived about where she was and who she was really talking to, to what was said in the next moment. Sensia blew her cheeks out. Largely up to you, Ledger. You're in a nearly unique situation, so there's no particular precedent. But zero documentation or not, you're essentially a fully functioning, viable, independent mind state and incontrovertibly sentient, with all that that implies regarding rights and so on. What does that imply? Ledger asked. She was already feeling relieved, but she wanted to be sure. Sincere grinned. Only good things, really. The first thing I imagine you might want to do is to be revented. What does that mean? Technical term for being brought back to life in a physical body, back in the real. For all that she had no real heart or mouth, that all this was a simulation, she felt her heart leap, her mouth start to go dry. That is possible. Possible? Advisable, kind of standard in such situations. Sensia gave a sort of throttled back laugh and waved out at the desert. As she swept her arm across the view, Ledeja caught brief glimpses of what she guessed were other virtual worlds within or alongside this one. Great gleaming cities, a mountain range at night crisscrossed with a tangle of tubes and lights, a vast ship or mobile city sailing on a creamy white sea beneath a cerulean sky a limitless-looking vista of nothing but air full of vast striped trees like green-blue curlicues, and views and structures that she saw but could hardly have described, which she guessed were possible in a virtual reality but impractical in what Sincere blithely called the real. Then the desert resumed. You could stay here, of course, Sincere told the Deja. In whatever environment or mix of them you find congenial, but I'd expect you might want a real physical body. Ledeja nodded. Her mouth was still dry. Could it really be this easy? I think, she said, I would. Sensible. There are, believe me, innumerable other things you could be revented into, in theory. But if I were you, I'd stick with the form you're used to, at first at least. Context is everything, and the first context we find ourselves in is that of our own body. She looked Ledeja up and down. You happy with the way you look now? Ledeja opened the blue robe she still wore, looking down at herself. She closed the robe again, its hems fluttered in the hot breeze. Yes, she hesitated. I can't decide if I want some form of tattoo or not. Easy to add later, though not at the genetic level you've been used to. Can't really sort you out with that. That info didn't travel. Sincere shrugged. I'll leave you with an image you can manipulate until you're happy with it. Take a speck from that. You'll grow a body for me. Complete a suspended one. How long will that take? Here, as little or as much time as you like. In the real, about eight days. Sincere shrugged again. My standard stock of mindless bods doesn't include the Sichiltian form. <laughs> Sorry. Is there a body I could be put into now? without waiting. Sincere smiled. Can't wait, eh? Ledeja shook her head, felt her skin grow warm. The truth was that if this was some cruel joke, she wanted to know as quickly as possible. If it was all genuine, then she didn't want to have to wait to have a real body to take her back to Sichult. It'll still take about a day or so, Sincere said. She nodded at a female human figure suddenly suspended in the air in front of them, naked, eyes closed. It looked vaguely Sichultian. Its skin was a sort of muddy grey. Then it changed to pure black, then to near white, then shifted through a modest spectrum of different colours. At the same time, the girth and height of the figure increased and then decreased. The shape of the head and the facial features changed a little too. That's the parameters you can play with, 
given the time available, Sincere told her. Ledeja was thinking. She recalled Vepa's own skin tone. How long might it take to make it look properly Sichultian, and not black, but sort of reddish gold? Sincere's eyes might have narrowed a fraction. A few hours more, a full day in total, perhaps. You'd look Sichultian, but you wouldn't really be so all the way through. Not inside. A blood test, tissue sample, or almost any invasive medical procedure would quickly reveal that. That's all right. I think that's what I'd like, Nadeja said. She looked sincere in the eye. I have no money to pay for this. She had heard that the culture survived without money, but hadn't believed a word of it. That's as well, sincere said reasonably. I have no charge to levy. You would do this out of kindness, or for my obligation. Let's call it kindness, but it's my pleasure. Then, thank you, Nadeja said. She bowed formally. Sincere smiled. I would also, Nadeja said, need to work my passage back to Sichult. Sincere nodded. I'm sure that can be arranged, though the word work doesn't really mean quite the same in the culture as it does in the enablement. Sincere paused. May I ask what you intend to do when you get back? Kill Mr. Joyler fucking vepers, of course, Ledeja thought grimly, and... But there were some things, some thoughts which were so secret, so potentially dangerous, she'd learned in effect to keep them even from herself. She smiled, wondered if this friendly-seeming virtual creature could read her thoughts in here. I have business to conclude there she said smoothly. Sencia nodded, expressionless. They both looked out towards the desert again. Chapter 6 Prin ignored the departing air vehicle. The giant black beetle ignored him in return. Its great wings unfolded to their full extent. A grinning death's head pattern was displayed on each, and then blurred into motion. The giant beetle lumbered upwards, the storm of air its wings produced kicked up dust and tiny shards of bone, as Prin, still holding the tiny, petrified form of Che against his massive chest with one of his forelimbs, reached the flat landing area and dashed across it for the door of the blood-powered mill. He threw open the door, then had to duck and squeeze through the doorway to get inside. He straightened up, roaring, the wind and dust from the departing aircraft's wings blowing a stormy haze about him and before him, sweeping over the dark, uneven floorboards to where the group of grinning demons and terrified pavilions were standing before a tall, glowing doorway of cool blue, set into the bone and sinew machinery of the mill's creaking, quietly shrieking interior. Somebody said, Three. Caught in the double whirlwind produced by the beetle's wings, the door behind Prin slammed shut, shaking the mill and reducing by half the little light that came from outside. Prin paused, taking stock. Che remained stiff in his forelimb. He thought he could feel her trembling against his chest and hear her whimpering. The demons and the pavilions presented a static tableau. A shallow ramp led down from the floor of the mill to the blue haze of the tall doorway, which trembled, light level fluctuating, as though it was made up of mist inside. Prin thought he caught a glimpse of movement beyond it, but it was impossible to be sure. There were six demons before him. They were of the smaller, four-legged kind, no match for him individually, but capable of overwhelming him en masse. Two of them were the ones who had come out of the mill to watch the beetle-shaped flyer land. The other four, each holding one of the pavilions, had come in on the beetle itself. Four pavilions left. Four must already have gone through the gateway, back to the reel. And what is it you might want? One of the mill demons said to Prin, as the other nodded to a pair of demons from the flyer. These two released their hold on the pavilions they were clutching. The two male pavilions landed on all fours and scuttled soundlessly down the ramp, vanishing into the blue mist of the doorway. The other mill demon said, One. No, no, no! One of the two remaining pavilions wailed, struggling in the grasp of the demon who held him. Shush now, the demon holding him said, shaking him. Might not be you who's staying. Brother? The mill demon who'd spoken to Prin took a step towards him. Prin felt a tiny, sharp barb penetrate the skin at his neck. The contraband code was about to run out. 
Four pulses warning. That's what he'd been told. Four pulses, and then he'd be back to his earlier self, just another coded pavilion, as helpless and hopeless as Che here, held tight and trembling against his chest. Another barb. So that was four, three. He didn't even try to roar again, waste of breath. He just charged, leaping forward at the group of demons and pavilions. He thudded into the approaching mill demon while surprise was still registering on its face and it was just starting to raise its trunks to fend him off. He half-headed it, half-shouldered it out of the way, sending it crashing to the floor. It was all happening very slowly. He wondered if this really was the speed that such moments of action seemed to happen at for predators in the real. One reason they were so good at bringing down their prey, perhaps. Or if this was an extra effect introduced just for the demons in hell to allow them an even greater advantage over their victims, or just to let them savour the moment all the more fully. The four demons from the flyer were all facing him now. The two holding pavilions did not worry him so much, he realised. He was thinking like a predator, like one of these bastards, because they didn't want to let go of their charges, at least not yet. By the time they thought the better of this, he knew it would all be over one way or the other. One of the remaining demons was faster to react than the other, opening its mouth into a snarl and starting to rise up on its hind legs while it brought its forelegs up towards him. He was aware of being slightly encumbered by the small hard weight he was carrying against his great furred chest. Che. Could he just throw her through the doorway from here? Probably not. He'd have to stop, take aim, lob her. It would take too long, and the way the angles worked, one of the demons would only need to raise one forelimb to catch her or knock her off course. By the time that happened, he'd have lost all his temporary power, and be no more strong than she was now, no match at all for even a single demon. He could use his slight lopsidedness to his advantage, he realised, as he took his next swinging, galloping step. The demon facing him, ready to tackle him, was allowing for how he was moving off kilter, unconsciously preparing to intercept Prin a couple of metres ahead according to the already set rhythm evident in the way he was moving. Prin threw Che from one forelimb to the other and pressed her hard into the other side of his chest. The gesture cost him a small amount of momentum, but gave him the greater advantage of throwing off the reckoning of the demon preparing to bring him down. Prin opened his jaws as the third barb made itself felt in his neck. One pulse left. The fourth barb would signal his instant return to the small, broken body he'd been trapped within for the last few months. The demon didn't even have time to look surprised. Prin crunched his jaws closed on the smaller demon. He felt his fangs penetrate furred skin, flesh, sinew and tendon, and then bite into the giving hardness of bone. He was already turning his head, an instinctive reaction giving his jaws time to fully close. The demon was starting to turn too now, pulled round by his attacker's greater weight. Prin went with the motion, keeping his jaws tight, feeling bones snap and crumple inside his mouth. He pivoted with the demon using their combined mass to swivel, even as he kept on charging forward, bringing the body of the bitten demon swinging round, legs flailing, to connect with the body of the second pouncing demon, knocking it aside in a snarling ball. Prin let his jaws open. The first demon was flung from them and went slithering along the floor, already bleeding, narrowly missing the legs of one of the other two demons still holding the pavilions. He was almost at the start of the slope to the blue glowing door. He made one last bound, launching himself through the air. As he did so, he knew he had made it, that they would get through the doorway. It floated up towards him as he rose in the air, still propelled by the last great thrust of his hind legs. One, he thought. The way the mill demon had said, one, after the last two pavilions had gone through, and just as he'd burst into the mill, a voice, the same voice he realised now, had said, three. Three. Then the two little pavilions had gone skittering through the blue glowing gate. One. He'd been counting down. Of course. The gate could count. The gate, or people operating it at this side, or more likely the other side, in the real, knew how many to expect, how many they were allowed to let through. Just one more person would be allowed to make the transition from the hell to the real. He reached the top of his last pouncing leap. The doorway spread before him, a glowing bank of blue mist filled with shadows. He wondered if the fact that he and Che were so close together would allow them both to make it through, if the gateway would be somehow fooled by this, or perhaps the fact she was catatonic, semi-conscious at best, would mean that she could make it through as well as him. He was starting to fall through the air, the gateway only a body length away now. 
He brought Che out from the side of his chest, moving her to a more central position, grasping her with both forelimbs as he pushed her in front of him. If there was really only one more person, one more coded consciousness allowed through, let it be her. He would have to take his chances here, accept whatever extra punishment these fiends could devise. She might be in no state to tell what had befallen them, of course. She might forget or deny all they had experienced. She might not believe it had happened at all. She had denied the existence of the real while she was here, surrendering all too easily to the grinding actuality of the horror around her. Why would she not likewise deny the unbelievable gruesomeness of hell once she was safely back in the real, if she was even able to remember it properly? What if she remained catatonic on the other side? What if she really had gone mad and no return to reality would change that? Was he to be gallant to the point of stupidity, or hard-headed to the point of selfishness, just wanting to save his own skin? He tucked himself in, bawling up and tumbling, somersaulting through the air as the blue glowing doorway rushed towards him. He would go through first, holding Che out behind him. He would never abandon her. She might abandon him. At that point, the contraband code's runtime reached its end. He changed back immediately, an instant before the two little pavulian bodies flew into the blue glowing mist. Chapter 7 The Halo 7 rolled magisterially across the misty plain, its stately progress marked by little lofted tufts and wisps of vapour which seemed to cling longingly to its tubes and spars as though reluctant to let go. The giant wheel let a temporarily cleared track through the mist behind it like a wake, affording glimpses of the land beneath before the silent grey presence flowed slowly back in. Vepers floated in the pool, looking out over the misted landscape to where some high rounded hills rose out of the grey, maybe twenty or more kilometres away. The water around him trembled and pulsed as the pool's car's shock absorbers struggled to iron out the Halo 7's trundling progress across the mist swaddled terrain. The Halo 7 was a wheel, a vehicle built to navigate the Great Plains, rolling hills and shallow inland seas of Abrek, Sichult's principal continent. 150 metres in diameter by 20 across, the Halo 7 looked entirely like a giant fairground wheel which had broken free from its supports and gone rolling across the land. The Veprine Corporation's Planetary Heavy Industries Division, Sichult, constructed several standard sizes and types of wheel. Most were mobile hotels, taking the rich on cruises across the continent. The Halo 7, Vepa's own privately owned vehicle, was the grandest and most impressive of the largest spokeless class, being no greater in diameter than the rest, but possessing 33 rather than 32 gondolas. The Halo 7's separate cars held sumptuous bedroom suites, banqueting halls, reception rooms, two separate pool and bath complexes, gyms, flower-filled terraces, kitchens, kitchen gardens, a command and communication pod, power and services units, garages for ground vehicles, hangars for flyers, boathouses for speedboats, sailboats and mini-subs, and quarters for crew and servants. Much more than a mode of transport, the Halo 7 was a mobile mansion. Rather than being fixed to the wheel's rims, the 33 cars could alter position, either at Vepa's whim or according to the dictates of the landscape beneath. Negotiating and especially traversing a steep slope where there was no ready-made wheel road, all the heavier pods could be brought down close to the ground, preventing the device from becoming dangerously top-heavy, and so allowing it to take on angles of lean that looked both unlikely and alarming. Perched at the top in a gimbaled observation gondola during such a manoeuvre, Vepers had been known to take great delight in terrifying guests with that trick. Getting from one pod to another could mean as little as a single step if the car's been brought up against each other, or a ride in one of several circumferential elevator units that moved around a smaller diameter ring fixed inside the wheel's principal structure. Vepers gazed out at the distant blue hills, trying to remember if he owned them or not. Are we still within the estate? he asked. Yaskin was standing at the poolside, keeping politely out of his master's view. Yaskin was scanning the misty landscape, the enhancing oculenses covering his eyes, zooming in on details, revealing the ground's mostly chilly heat signature, and showing him any radio sources. I'll ask, he said, and muttered something, putting a finger to the comms bud attached to his ear as he listened. 
Yes, sir, he told Vepers. Captain Boussard informs us we are about thirty kilometers inside the estate's boundaries. Yaskin used a small keypad on the back of the cast covering his left arm to call up the requisite overlay on the view the oculenses were presenting. Thirty clicks was about right. The Halo 7's commander, Captain Boussard, was female. Yaskin suspected she had been hired for her pleasing looks rather than on merit, so, where possible, he checked any assertions she made, waiting, so far unsuccessfully, for a mistake he could use to convince Vepers of her unfitness for the post. Hmm, Vepers said. Now he thought about it, he didn't really care whether he owned the hills or not. His right hand went to his face without thinking about it. His fingers were gently tracing the prosthetic covering that had replaced the tip of his nose while the flesh and cartilage regrew beneath. It was a pretty good fake, especially with a bit of makeup on top, but he was still self-conscious about it. He'd cancelled a few engagements and postponed many more in the days since the debacle in the opera house. What a mess that had been. They hadn't been able to keep it completely quiet, of course, especially as he'd had to cancel that evening's engagement at such short notice. Dr. Sulbazgi had come up with their cover story, which was that Yaskin had accidentally sliced the tip of his master's nose off while they were fencing. Oh, that'll have to do, Vepers agreed, as he lay on the treatment couch in the clinic suite, deep within the Uberwata townhouse, less than an hour after the girl had attacked him. He was painfully aware that his voice sounded strange, strangled and nasal. Sulbazgi was bandaging his nose and prepping it with coagulant, antiseptic and a stabilizing preparatory gel. A specialist plastic surgeon had been summoned and was on his way. The girl's body had already been bagged and placed in the mortuary freezer. Dr. Zulbazgi would see to its disposal later. Vepers was still shaking a little, despite whatever Zulbazgi had given him for the shock. He lay there thinking as the doctor fussed about him. He was waiting for Yaskin to return. He was on his way back from the opera house, having made sure everything had been squared away and everybody had their stories straight. He shouldn't have killed the girl. It had been stupid, impetuous. On the rare occasion that sort of thing was necessary, you just never got involved directly. That was what delegation was for. What people like Yaskin, and whoever he employed specifically for such tasks, was for. Always keep it deniable. Always at a remove. Always have a true alibi. But he'd been too excited by the chase. By the knowledge that the runaway was still so close and so trapped within the opera house, practically waiting to be caught. Of course he'd wanted to be part of the hunt, the capture. Still, he shouldn't have killed her. It wasn't just how much she'd been worth, how much wasted effort and money she represented. It was the embarrassment of having lost her. People would notice her continued absence. The cover story after she'd run off from the Couturiers had been that she was ill. The PR people had hinted at some rare ailment that only the Intagliated suffered from. Now they would either have to claim she'd died of it, meaning problems with the Surgeon's Guild, the insurance people and possibly lawyers for the clinic that had overseen her intagliation in the first place, or go with the even more humiliating, though partially true narrative that she'd run away. He'd already entertained the idea that they might claim she'd been kidnapped, or allowed to join a nunnery or whatever, but both would lead to too many complications. At least he'd got the knives back. They were still tucked into the waistband of his trues. He touched their hilts again, reassuring himself they were still there. Yaskin had wanted to dispose of them, the idiot. No need to dispose of the murder weapon when you were going to dispose of the body properly. Stealing the knives. The sheer fucking effrontery of it. In the end, she'd been nothing more than an ungrateful little thief, and biting him. Maybe even trying to bite his throat out and kill him. How dare the little bitch do that? How dare she put him in this situation? He was glad he'd killed her. And it was a first for him, he realised. Directly taking a life was one of the few things he'd never done. When this had all calmed down, when his nose had regrown and things had gone back to normal, he'd still have that, he supposed. He remembered that until he'd first taken her against her will, maybe ten years or so ago, he'd never raped anybody before either. There had been no need. So, he got two firsts from her. If he was being generous, he would reluctantly concede that that was some sort of compensation for all the pain and inconvenience she was putting him through. Quite a thing, though, doing something like that. Actually plunging a knife into somebody and feeling them die. It shook you, no matter how strong you were. He could still see the look in the girl's eyes as she died.
Yaskin came in then, removing his ocular lenses and nodding to the two Zii guarding the clinic suite's door. You'll have to be injured too, Yaskin, Leppers told him immediately, glaring at his chief of security as though it really had all been his fault. Which, now he thought about it, was true, as it had ultimately been Yaskin's responsibility to keep an eye on the scribble child and make sure she didn't go running off anywhere. We're going to say you took my nose off while we were fencing, but we can't have people thinking you actually bested me. You'll have to have an eye out. Yaskin's face, already pale, went paler. Ah, uh, but, sir, or a broken arm, something serious. Dr. Sulbazki nodded. I think the broken arm. He looked at Yaskin's forearms, perhaps choosing on Beppa's behalf. Yaskin glared at Sulbazki. Sir, please, he said to Veppers. You could make it a clean break, couldn't you, Sulbazki? Veppers asked. Quick to heal? Easily, Sulbazki said, smiling at Yaskin. Sir, Yaskin said, drawing himself up. Such an action would compromise my ability to protect you in the event that our other layers of security were disabled, and I was all that stood between you and an assailant. Hmm, oh, I suppose so, Veppers said. Still, we need something. He frowned, thinking. How would you like a dueling scar, on the cheek, where everybody would see it? It would have to be a very big, very deep scar, Dr. Sulbazki said reasonably. Probably permanent. He shrugged as Yaskin glared at him again. To be proportionate, he protested. Might I suggest a fake cast for a couple of weeks, Yaskin said, tapping his left arm. The broken arm story would still hold, but I would not be truly disabled. He smiled thinly at the doctor. I might even conceal additional weaponry within the cast for any emergency. Veppers liked that. Good idea, he nodded. Let's go with that. Now, floating in the pool at the summit of the Halo 7, his fingers feeling tentatively around the strange, warm surface of the prosthetic, Veppers smiled at the memory. Yaskin's compromise had been sensible but seeing the look on his face when he thought they were going to put out one of his eyes or actually break his arm had been one of the truly bright spots in a dreadful evening. He gazed out at the mountains again. He'd ordered the gondola containing the pool to be kept at the summit of the great vehicle while he had his early morning swim. He turned round and struck out for the other side of the pool, where one of his harem troop had fallen asleep, wrapped in a thick robe and lying on a sunbed. Veppers had what he honestly believed was the best-looking ten-girl harem troop in the enablement. This girl, Pleur, was special even within that august selection. One of his two impressionist girls, able to take on the appearance and mannerisms of whatever female public figure he'd taken a shine to recently. Of course he'd had his share, much more than his fair share, as he was the first to acknowledge, of super-famous screen stars. Singers, dancers, screen presenters, athletes, and the very occasional hot politician, and so on. But such pursuits could be terribly time-consuming. The truly famous, even when they were available, not committed, expected to be wooed over time, even by the richest man in the enablement. And it was usually a lot simpler just to have one of the Impressionist girls alter herself, and have herself altered surgically, where the change would take too long otherwise, to look like the relevant beauty. It wasn't as though he really wanted them for their minds, after all, and this way also had the advantage of letting you compensate for any bodily deficiencies in the original. As he swam, Veppers looked over at Yaskin and nodded towards the sleeping girl, who currently looked identical to, unusually for Veppers, an academic. Pleur had recently taken on the appearance of a severely beautiful doctor of eugenics from Lombe, whom Veppers had first glimpsed at a ball in Ibruata City earlier in the year but who had proved annoyingly determined to remain faithful to her husband, even in the face of the sort of blandishments and gifts that were guaranteed to turn almost anybody's head, husbands included where it merely meant turning a blind eye. Yaskin walked over towards Pleur's sleeping form as Veppers arrived at the side of the pool, then trod water and mined what Yaskin was to do. Yaskin nodded, went to the back of the sunbed, gripped its lower frame, and, only slightly hindered by the fake cast on his arm, swiftly hoisted the rear of the sunbed up to head height, tipping the girl into the pool with a splash and a spluttering scream. Veppers was still laughing and fending off Pleur's flapping blows while pulling her robe off, when Yaskin frowned, put one finger to his ear, then got down on both knees at the poolside and started waving urgently. What? 
Veppers shouted at Yaskin, exasperated. A near miss from one of Pleur's hands skiffed one cheek and splashed water into his eyes. Not on the nose, you dumb bitch! It's Sulbaski, Yaskin told him. Highest urgency. Veppers was much bigger and stronger than Pleur. He gripped her, turned her round and held her tightly while she cursed at both him and Yaskin, coughing and spitting water all the while. What? Something happening in Ubruata? Veppers asked. No, he's in a flyer on his way here. Four minutes out. Won't say what, but insists it's highest urgency. Shall I tell Bousser to summit the landing platform? Veppers sighed. I suppose. He got Pleur's robe off at last. She had mostly stopped struggling and coughing. Go and meet them, he told Yaskin, who nodded once and walked off. Veppers pushed the naked girl towards the side of the pool. As for you, young lady, he said, biting her neck hard enough to produce a yelp, you've been terribly ill-mannered. I have, haven't I? Pleur agreed. She knew just what Veppers liked to hear. I need to be taught a lesson, wouldn't you say? Yes, I would. Assume the position. He shoved the floating weight of the robe out of the way as Pleur braced herself against the edge of the pool with both hands. Won't be long, he called after Yaskin's retreating back. Still a little breathless, still with a pleasant glow of satiation about him and still dripping from inside his fluffy robe, Veppers sat forward and looked at the thing lying in Dr. Sulbazki's broad, pale yellow palm. He, Sulbazki, still wearing his lab coat, which was an unusual sight, Yaskin and Astil, Veppers butler, were the only people in the lavishly furnished lounge. Outside, beyond plump brocade bolsters, wagging tassels, gently clinking chandeliers and trembling gold thread window fringes, the view was of the slowly clearing mists before and behind the wheel as it continued on its journey through the spreading pastel light of dawn. Thank you, Astil, Veppers said, accepting a cup of chilled infusion from his butler. That's all. Sir, Astil said, bowing and exiting. Veppers waited until he had gone before saying, So, what have we here? Whatever it was, it looked like a small bunch of very fine wires, their colour a sort of dull matte silver with a hint of blue. Scrunch it up, he thought, and you'd have something like a pebble, something so small you could probably swallow it. Sulbaski looked tired, frazzled, almost ill. It was found in the furnace, he told Veppers, and ran a hand through his thin, unkempt hair. What furnace? he asked. He'd come into this, thinking it was going to prove to be one of those matters that seemed terribly important and momentous to those around him, but which he could, having cast his eye over it, happily leave for them to worry about and sort out if possible. That was, after all, what he paid them for. Now, just from the feel in the room, he was starting to think there might be a real problem here. There shouldn't have been anything left, Yaskin said. What temperature? The fun is in the Vepers Memorial Hospital, Fulbazgi said, rubbing his face with his hands, not looking Vepers in the eye. Our little friend from the other night. Great God, the girl, Vepers realized, with a disturbing feeling in his belly. Now what? Was the fractious bitch to pursue him from beyond the grave? Okay, he said slowly. And all very unfortunate, I'm sure we can agree. But what has... He waved at the silvery-blue wires still displayed in Solbazgi's hand. What has whatever this is got to do with that? It's what was left of her body, Solbazgi said. There shouldn't have been anything left, Yaskin said. Not if the furnace was... The fucking furnace was at the right fucking temperature, Solbazgi shouted shrilly. Yaskin whipped off his oculenses, his expression furious. He looked ready to start a fight. Gentlemen, please, Vepers said calmly, before Yaskin could reply. He looked at the doctor. As simply as you can, Silbazki, for the non-technically minded. What the hell is this thing? It's a neural lace, the doctor said, sounding exhausted. A neural lace, Vepers repeated. He'd heard of these things. They were the sort of device that highly advanced aliens, who'd started out squidgy and biochemical, as squidgy and biochemical as Sichultians, for example and who had not wanted to upload themselves into Nirvana or Oblivion or wherever, used when they wanted to interface with machine minds or record their thoughts, or even 
when they wanted to save their souls, their mind states. Vepers looked at Srubazgi. Are you saying, he said slowly, that the girl had a neural lace in her head? That shouldn't be possible. Neural laces were illegal for Sichultians. Great God, fucking drug glands were illegal for Sichultians. Kind of looks like it, Srubazgi said. And it never showed up? Vepers asked. He stared at the doctor. Sulbazgi, you must have scanned that girl a hundred times. They don't show up using the equipment we've got to look with, Sulbazgi said. He stared down at the thing in his hand, gave a tiny, despairing laugh. Mine a miracle we can see it with the naked eye. Who put it in her? Vepers asked. The clinicians? Sulbazgi shook his head. Impossible. Then who? I've done a quick bit of investigating since the doctor told me about this, Yaskin said. We need help here, sir. Somebody who knows properly about this sort of thing. Zingra, Zulbazki said. He'll know or know better how to find out. Zingra, Epis said, frowning. The Jalupian trader and honorary consul was his principal contact with the alien civilization the enablement was closest to. Yaskin had a sour look on his face that Vepers recognized. It meant he was having to agree with Zulbazgi. Both men knew this had to be kept as quiet as possible. Why were they suggesting bringing the alien into this? He, she, or it might know, Yaskin said. The point is, it'll be able to find out if this thing really is what it looks like. And what the fuck does it look like? Vepers asked. Yaskin took a deep breath. Well, like a neural lace device, the sort of thing the so-called culture uses. He grimaced. Vepers saw the man grind his teeth for a moment. It's hard to tell. It could be a fake. With our technology, why would anyone go to this trouble to fake it? Zulbazki said angrily. Vepers held up one hand to quiet him. Yaskin glared at the doctor but went on. It isn't possible to be sure, which is why we might need Zingra and the sort of analysis and diagnostic equipment he has access to. But it looks like this thing is one of their devices, a cultural device. Vepers looked at them both in turn. It's a culture device, he asked. He held out his hand and let Sulbazgi tip the thing into his palm. The closer he looked, the more tiny, still finer filaments he could see, branching and rebranching off the main, already very thin wires. It felt amazingly soft. It weighed next to nothing. Looks very likely, the doctor agreed. Vepers bounced the thing up and down in his hand a couple of times. A handful of hair would have weighed more. Okay, he said. But what does this mean? I mean, she wasn't a culture citizen or anything, was she? No, Shulbazki said. And she didn't seem to be able to interface with any equipment. Vepers looked from the doctor to Yaskin, who was now standing with his oculenses dangling the arm in the cast folded across his chest, his other arm resting on it, hand stroking the skin around his mouth repeatedly. He was still frowning. No, Sulbazki said again. She might not even have known the thing was in there. What? Refus said. But how? These things grow inside you, Yaskin said. If it really is one, then it'll have started as a seed and grown all around and into her brain. Fully developed, these things link with just about every brain cell, every synapse. Why didn't she ever have the size of a basket fruit? Vepers asked. He grinned, but neither man responded. That was very unusual, and not a good sign. These things add less than half a percent to the bulk of the brain, Yaskin said. He nodded at the thing lying in Vepers' palm. Even what you see there is mostly hollow. In the brain it'll be filled with fluid or bits of the brain itself. The tiniest filaments are so thin they are invisible to the naked eye, and they'll probably have been burned off in the furnace anyway. Vepers stared at the strange, insignificant-looking device. But what was it in her brain to do? he asked both men. What was it for? Given that we'd established it didn't seem to give her any superpowers or anything. These things are used to record a person's mind state, Yaskin said. Their soul, for want of a better word, Zulbazki said. It's so culture people can be reincarnated if they die unexpectedly, Yaskin said. I know, Vepers said patiently. 
I've looked into the technology myself. Don't think I'm not jealous. He tried another smile. Still no response. This must be serious. Well, Yaskin said, it's not impossible that such information, her mind state, was transmitted somewhere else at the point of death. It's what these things are for, after all. Transmitted, Lepers said. Where? Not far, Yaskin began. I can't see how, Zulbalski shook his head, glancing at Yaskin. I've done my own research. It takes time and a full clinical setup. It's a person's entire personality we're talking about here. They have a memory. You don't squirt that out in a beat or two like a fucking text message. We are dealing with what the aliens call level eight technology, Yaskin said contemptuously. You don't know what it might be capable of. We're like pre-will primitives looking at a screen and saying it can't work because nobody can redraw a cave painting that quickly. There are still limits, Zulbarski insisted. Doubtless, Yaskin said, but we have no idea what they are. Zulbarski drew breath to speak, but Vepers just talked over the start of whatever he had been about to say. Well, in any event, bad news, perhaps, gentlemen. He reached out, let Zulbarski take the device back. The doctor bagged it put it in a pocket of his lab coat, sealed it, 